Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., research librarian and archivist here at the Bronx County Historical Society. And I am joined by pioneering graffiti artist Butch Two for this oral history. So Today is Thursday, April 13th, 2023, and we have the distinct honor of documenting an oral history with Bomb Five. Welcome, Bomb Five. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, y'all. This is Bomb Five from the Boogie Down Bronx, which we used to call the Burnt Down Bronx. They know when game Boogie Down, but uh, yeah, I'm from the I'm from the East Bronx, and I've been writing. I'm a b-boy DJ. You know, I was a gang member, and you know, other things that had to do with the Bronx. So I'm here to let you know my story in my way. Thank you, Bomb Five, and Butch Two is going to begin the oral history questions. Butch, take it away. Okay. Bomb Five, talk to us about your family history. Background, where your parents are from. I'm, I'm born in Puerto Rico. My, my, my father is African. My mother's Puerto Rican. My grandfather came to Puerto Rico for work. And when he got work in Puerto Rico, he brought his kids over. His kids met my mother and started having kids in, New in Puerto Rico. Then we moved to New York. And then my rest of my brothers and sisters born here. But uh, there's uh, 10 of us. Wow. 10 of us, and uh, all from the same mother and father. Nice. And we're all here, man. We're all living our life. When we came to this place called New York, when we came to this place in New York, things had to change with paperwork and stuff because in, in New York, when you came from Puerto Rico or other country, there was some uh, to get help from the government. Mm -hmm. So. You know, my big brother told me they had to take care of some paperwork. And some things had to be changed and years and dates to get uh, things done. Right. So my mother could get benefits. So, you know, they just came to America. There's no job. And the thing about people don't understand about that, you know, like how sometimes people get mad at Puerto Rican people, that they get we get brought to New York, but we get thrown in the hood with black people. And then the black people get upset at the Puerto Ricans because the Puerto Ricans can't speak English. But that's not our fault for them to talk like that. So the problem with that point in time was some blacks didn't like that now we're getting all these kind of different people in their hood, which there's no room already because black people are already living here for years and doing their thing. And then you got people moving in that can't even speak English to them. Right. So it's like conflict and, you know, a lot of... Uh, bad vibes in, in some ways. But that's when the poor blacks had to learn the Puerto Rican people were not weak people. Because when they started with the Puerto Ricans and chumping on them, the Puerto Rican had to build themselves. That's why gangs had to start forming. In the early um, days, from Spanish Harlem, Brooklyn, to the Bronx, they had to start forming groups to protect themselves and their people. You know, it was not because they hated them. It was like now they're picking on us because we, we're not here. We're not from here. So they had a bill. So my oldest brother was a Mau Mau. That was a all Puerto Rican gang from Brooklyn. You know? And he was part of that. And uh, this goes way back to the 50s, you know? And when we came in here. When, it, you know, my family came in. But he was part of that. And, you know, I'm just saying about that part. Like, people couldn't understand that. I'm just trying to say it. But after we grew up and started growing, other generation kid growing, we started forming together with the blacks to understand each other. Because now we can speak English. And people start joining and having relationships and understanding that we both came from the same place, from nothing, you know? Even though like, we came from a beautiful island, it still was poor in a way, you know? Right. Puerto Rico was beautiful, but we were still poor. Like, you is. know, you, you made your, your, your dues. It's like every country. You got every, every level has their... You know, you could be Puerto Rican, but you got Puerto Rican here, there, and there. You know, like black, same thing. It ain't, you know, it ain't like they just all poor. Mm -hmm. Some got something, you know. And sometimes they get something and they don't look out for their own people. And that's the sad thing about life. Some people make it and they don't look out for their culture. Yeah, true, true. You know? Do uh, were you too young, or do you have? Would you like to share your earliest memories of Puerto Rico with us? Yeah, I was too young, but I just know beautiful happiness. Happiness, you know, sun, farm, you know. It was my arrest, my arrest at uh, Ponce, where my father's from. We moved over for work 
in my west, not my mom. But yeah, it, it was uh, it was beautiful. It was yeah. beautiful the time being. The right. time things had to be moved up. My father thought a better opportunity to come to New York. It was opening up, so thinking about how we, they can make you know the thing happen. For sure. Can you tell us about the type of music your parents listened to at home and you were exposed to? Oh, it was always Spanish music. It was always, you know, it was the salsa, mango, mambo, or whatever it was they listened to. But what I noticed that as I was growing up in Europe, they started getting into American culture. Okay. They started hearing, like, you could hear some rock and roll, you know, some rock and roll music, Elvis and all that stuff, you know. And sometimes I, I don't, you know, when people like, okay, you get older, you're like, yeah, this guy was racing or this or Come on, man. When you're young, you're just enjoying the moment. My right. mom loved Elvis, man. That means <laughs> what? What happened, you know? She loves certain artists, you know? You can't be like, oh, now you gotta hate it. After you love something, you didn't know nothing really about too much. And then you gotta hate it. It's like hard for anyone. Like me, I love rock and roll too. I love my salsa music. I love this and that. And then when you get older and you're with people and they're like, ah, yeah, yeah, fuck that. But B, like, why? Why? You liked it too. They only had a few radio stations, man, back in the day. You could hear soul, you could hear a little punk on the radio. But a lot of most of the radio stations that were popular were NBC, ABC, you know? And they play a lot of soft rock and they play a lot of rock and roll. So, like, how can you not say you didn't grow up with it, you know? Mm -hmm. You put it on the radio station, you're going to hear it. And then you turn it over, you go to a. WBLB, what was it, that station? BLS. No, what BLS? LRB or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 that's, that's it. way back. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. LRB. Yeah, they play some soul there, you know. And, yeah, there were certain, certain stations, man. I don't know, there was no, BL, no BLS, uh, the other one. That came later on. Right, right. Know? Okay, can you tell us about, talking about your mother, what kind of meals did she cook at home that you remember and oh, enjoyed eating? Yeah, all mm. that senior food, my phone call. Lots of noise, man. Rice and beans, yuca, everything you name that Spanish, she brought it to New America. And they, you know, we had the opportunity. So when everybody start coming in, you got people that have little money and make a little, you know, little uh, store front that sell sometimes from their own house. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in the front of the house, you have boxes of yuca, sweet, you know, certain foods, you know, and, and Bustelo coffee. Come on, you got to get the Bustelo coffee. And then when, we, when you're poor, when you're young, you got to run outside and get the cheese from the guy that comes by. Big block of cheese, man. Government and you got to eat that Swiss cheese, that, that what, grilled cheese. And yeah. it was a, yeah. I was sick of cheese. <laughs> yeah. It was cheese for days and days <laughs> and days. Yeah. But my, my father worked hard, and he got a, he got a job. He, he became good. He got a job. He was a mechanic, and he was a boxer. He told me he was a boxer. Wow. So he did good for a long time, and uh, he uh, when he came here, he was also good with cars and all that. So when he came here, he got a job as a mechanic. Mm -hmm. and then he moved up to work for some uh, Jewish company that had a trucking company. And he would fix the trucks. And with that, he became good with them, and um, he became the first black foreman after a few years. He was so good that some people couldn't even find, like, he was good at troubleshooting. Right. So they would go to him, and next thing you know, he'd pinpoint things. Say, hey, I got it. And then he would work it, work it out, and they go, hey, this guy, we got to keep this guy, you know. And then his money went up a little, and that kind of helped us because he, he was so close to the Jewish guy at that time. And, you know, he really loved my father, loved what my father was doing for the company and working. And when my father decided, you know, he... You got all these kids now, you know? There's so many kids. And we're living in a small building, 174th and Hall Avenue. Well, really, 175th, where, I, you know, I grew up in the Bronx. And it's kind of like, um, you got 10 kids, like, you know, one bedroom. Like, it was crazy. There was just mattresses everywhere uh, growing up. You know, we were just there to sleep. Get up and go to school. Get up and go to school, just sleep. There was no room to play in. Other. And then my building... At the time, as time went, it got bad, really worse. And um, I lived in a building. I remember when I went down the hallway, you had so many empty apartments. Empty. So I used to play in them apartments because it was getting bad. That's when this, it started the beginning of the, you know, later on, the burning of the Bronx yeah, and all that. Yeah. I joined the gang. But before that, 
you know, it was already messed up. So my father tried to work real hard, and and the Jewish guy, he helped my father a lot and helped get us a house. Nice. Yeah. Got us a house in a nice white area called Van Ness area back in the day. And after that, my life in the street started because my father was murdered. And after that, it went on to my life in the street. So that part is done with my family. Now the next part is why I grew up really in the Bronx. There you go. Now you talked about your neighborhood. What Bronx neighborhood are you from? And tell us your earliest name memories. 175th and Hoa Avenue. Okay, what's that? What was it like growing up there? Your earliest yeah. memories. Yeah. You no, know, it was great around there. I had great friends, you know. My uncle kind of started... My uncle started a, a crew there back, a gang back in the days called Seven Crown, you know? So they did something, but they were trying to protect themselves too, you know? So he was out there. But no, a lot of good time going to Katona Park, going to, yeah, just everywhere. Once my father got a car, I remember he got his first like station wagon, but he needed something like with a trunk to fill all the kids up, man. <laughs> Yo, you couldn't get a regular car or a drill car. So we had a station wagon. With that kind of fake wood on the side, yeah, right? Yeah. With panel. Yeah, yeah. So, so we had that, and um, everybody be in the back. Everybody went to the back window. The back window was so old, you had to go down too. It was not electric yet, you know. Like he had a, uh, this long window, you know, and then the side windows, everything. But we would go there, you know, take us to Orchard Beach, and you know, all around. He took us. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was great. It was great, but damn. Yeah. But I gotta step away from that because now, just thinking about my pops in that horrible time don't got me good right now. But okay. hey, I, my family is beautiful. They did it the best they can. My yep. father left my mother with beautiful kids. And I think God had something in my father. I mean, love my, had some love for my family that he didn't want my mom to die. Because usually when you love someone so much and been with them for so long, they then usually die right after, most of the time, because they're sad. They miss the person. Mm -hmm. For some reason, God said, you're not going nowhere. And my mother's still alive to this day at 93 years old. Wow. That's 93. Yeah. My father would have been like 96, I think. Right? Yeah, he'd be he's a little older, like 96, 97 years old. But, you know, for God, for my mother to be alive through all this whole thing, that she wanted to end her life so many times, I just want to stop because it was too much for her. I think uh, God said, no, you can't. You can't leave these kids, man. You need, they love you and they need you. So uh, made my mother super strong because what's well, well, she doing still around, you know? Right. Usually, yeah, it'd be gone, but she took the good and the, a lot of bad and made it good. And we all here still, the kids, except for two passed away, but my, my family two passed away. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, she's happy. As long as she's around, I want to be there for her. She's, that's, right. that's my queen. You know, without her, that's I wouldn't right. be nobody. And I want to give 100% back to her. More than 100%. A lot of people need to leave their kid, their moms, or think about their life. Yeah, I'm living a good life before, and I'm still living a good life. As long as my mother's alive, I'm having a good life. You know? That's, that's, awesome. Yeah. that's awesome. We're going to switch it up. Talk to us about the neighborhood games you remember playing as a kid. Johnny ride a pony. Ring Olivia. Oh, <laughs> Skelly's, man. Yeah. Skelly's Wars. Block against blocks, yo. Everybody in school trying to take it off the chair after a while. First, you had to cast off the Coca-Cola bottles because, you know, they were wanting glass back in the day, you mm -hmm. know. So we needed to take the cast. And then one guy said, oh, you got to put wax from a candle, right. so your mother's candle, you start taking them, you can't find them when they have a blackout or something in the house, no electricity, and having problems or whatever, but you take it and you start filling it up, the, the cap, right. the metal cap with it, and then you gotta scrape it so it could be really slidey, you know, on the, on the ground, and then the next one came from school, under the chairs, the metal top, they right. were faster and better, they had different sizes, you know, they had the regular set, they had the little small one, and they, you really could speed it up. Get them from far. And then you fill it up also with wax or with crayon. Right. So you start melting it, you know, with a lighter. That was, that was good. 
And, you know, tag, kick the can. You know, and, but, you know, like, my kid game kind of ended early because, you know, like I said, you know, like, after my pop's gone, you know, it's a, a whole different life started for me, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, take us through the schools you attended and tell us a little about each of them, from public school on up. Yeah, I went to the school in 174, but I had got, I went to the school for a while and then I got kicked out and I had to go to public school. Um, 105 it is, in Helen Parker. So I was getting too, Trump, into too much trouble and my mom like got me into that school with an with a address. My cousin was living they, they came and they started living like near Janelle Towers in the Helen Parker area. Mm -hmm. So when you use their address, I could go to a better school. And then my brothers and sister younger than me started going there too. We used their address for some time. And uh, yeah, it was all right. It, it was all right. I finished. Uh, yeah. <laughs> finished the best I can. But I finished. But you know, I was already like dealing. Like the life went from good to like down for me. You know? I just started looking for a different life. And so when my father passed away, and then um, my cousin was part of a gang called the Savage Stones. And that's a new chapter of my life. Right. That's what made me become a man. And it was early on. I, I was not even a teenager when I joined them. And it was like, that was my life from then on. Okay. What middle school and high school did you go to? Uh, I went to uh, 167. And then I got kicked out of there, so I went to 127. Uh, I don't like to talk about this stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So I, I went to 167, and still in trouble, and then get left back, and then my mother like, helped me again and get another fake address or someone else that lived around Castle Hill, and I went to 127. I went to 127. And then I went to, and then I tried to think about my life as, a, as a, what I like to do with art. So I went to music and art, which Butch went to. And Bad 700, my boy Bad 700 oh, set. Yeah. Back one, yeah. yeah. And Pooh 2. But uh, I went there, and then uh, I felt like kind of racist in there, like a little bit. Like my, when I was in there, I felt like the teacher was always trying to pick on me because I was telling them about graffiti. And I want to be a graphic designer and graffiti letters and blah, blah. And he didn't like the whole saying mm -hmm. in the 70s to me. And he's like, yeah, he just appointed me out to other kids. Man, this guy wouldn't be a graffiti writer that scribble scrabble. And I was like, no, 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 that's an art. You don't know nothing about it. They were like, no, no. And he made me feel. So one day he came to me and I was doing like some graffiti. He said, I told you. So he hit me, he tapped me like hard. I said, yo, don't be touching me. And then he said, no, you listen to me. So he pulled my ear and I punched him. And then I got kicked out of the school and I went to Monroe High School. Because, yo, you don't touch me. I told him, no, no one don't touch me, man. You're not my father. And he touched me. And then when he pulled my ear, I got crazy, and it was over. They said, no, you got to go. So I got kicked out of music and all, and I went to Jane Monroe High School, mm -hmm. because the neighborhood school. And then I went to Monroe, and then I, I couldn't, you know. But then my life, you know, I took care of my life. I came, I went away for a minute, and I came back. I took my GED in Bronx Community College, went to school there, and I stepped up. I went there to Bronx Community College, and then I went to the college of Bronx Community College after I got my GED. And uh, it was funny, like, everybody's like, you're a bad kid, you're dumb. But my first time I took the GED, I passed it. And I didn't even study good. Right. I just went, and I'm not even good at math. But I went, and they, they schooled me in Bronx Community College when they prepared you for the GED. And I was like, oh, I gotta do something, I'm doing too much bad stuff. My mom, Randy, her sad. So I started thinking in my mind, how can I, I, I let my mother know that I'm not a stupid kid? Mm -hmm. So I got my GED, passed it. I went to Bronx Community College for like a, two, seven, a year. And then I went to, I waited a while. She never pushed me for no college. Then she was just happy that I got my GED. And then over the years, then I went to Parson. I finished up at Parson, okay. you know, downtown. And then, <coughs> yeah. Do you remember when you first saw graffiti? Was it in the staircase, at school, the train? Where was it? And how did it influence you at the time? First of all, I didn't even know it was graffiti. Because I was in a gang. It was Blackie McCardle, Hollywood, my cousin C2, S-E-E-2. And uh, he's the one that got me in the gang. I used to look up to my cousin. 
He was almost five years older than me, but my cousin was my cousin. That was like my brother. And he was my first cousin. He was badass. I mean, I'm telling you, when I'm nine years old doing this game, and this guy is already 13, but he was like, stop. I'm like, yo. He's like, push up, push up, push up, chin up, push up. I was like, yo. I was like, what? I was like, show me, show me. And, you know, because that dude, I remember him having muscles since he was 10 years old. I don't know. This dude always had this built like this built like, you look at me like, you know, and then he takes off his shirt. You're like, uh, uh, you know, one of those two. Mm -hmm. When I was in the train with my cousin, people look at me and he had this look that he told me, death handle. And he, he had this look down the train when someone like pushing or something. He got this look like, and people just like, couldn't even stare because he stayed there like I'm waiting for you. You came in pushing me through the train. What do you want to do next? Because I can set it off, but I might I might kill you. You know, it's ruthless sometimes, you know, growing up in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. It ain't gonna be an easy fight, you know. He he was tough. He was badass. Blackie, the leader of the black uh Savage Gold, Hollywood, the vice president. Everybody else in Bob respected my cousin. He he was no joke. He was warlord at one one time with them, but he was he was the one. He wasn't scared to go anywhere. Everybody knew him. If it wasn't from school, the streets or someone, they knew him. You know? He had that look and that, that physical appearance and then you feel like, yo, this guy looks like not to be playing with. So he taught me how he got me into that life because I, I, I was lost. And so I found another family in the street, you know, in Tiffany Street. And he brought me over there, and then, you know, they gave me the name Spider. You know, I had to go through the whole, the whole thing, you know, to join the gang. But the main thing I remember when I was proud of Hollywood said, we're going to pass you a name. You're fast with your hands, but, you know, they see if you can fight. Or, you know, there's a lot of things they test you. And um, I was, you know, I had to rack up in the summer some quarts of beers for them. They said, go in that store, bring us something. I'm like, well, I'm going to bring. They said, bring us something we like to drink. I went there and racked up two quarters, but I couldn't with someone. There's nowhere to put it. So what I did was I just went in the back, looked around, made sure no one by the door, and I ran out with two. And they said, they'll be in the corner. I got to the corner, no one was there. I had to run with them until I got to the clubhouse and gave it to them. They're like, oh, are you good with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to make money off of Gustavo, this, that, and you rack up the stuff kit. Yeah, all right. Hey, I was getting two, three dollars for you know, I'm a little kid. I'm getting a little something, and then it became like uh, um. So I became a member, and they blessed me with a name. They gave me the name Spider. And they said I, I fought good with my hands. You know, when you fight, you look like I had a lot of hands for a spider. Also, I was fast. Spiders are fast. So he said, I named you Spider. I said, All right. I took it. I'm a small guy. And, you know, uh, I was small but strong. And then he passed me. Um, and where was I from? 174th Street. I'm from 175th, but 174th with this train station. That's like the main strip. Mm -hmm. So I became 174th Spider. Why 174th Spider? Not Spider 174? Because my block came before me. My block was my energy. My block was my family. The people around me was my people. So 174th Spider was my name, you know? And that's my name. But for seeing graffiti, I just, I just know Hollywood would have told me, yo, just put it up. Just put up. And I said, what's it? Put up. Yeah, just write up. Put up SS13, Savage Skulls, YS, Young Skulls, whatever, BB Bobbies. Just put it up. I'm like, all right, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and what we mostly did was I went to my building and I went down in the basement of the super and I found a bucket of paint and paint when I took that and I started going on the rocks again. <laughs> you know, just writing like savage skulls on the rock. And they would see it beating, oh, that was your head. I, you know, I started getting a different kind of props, you know, because, mm -hmm. I, you know, the fighting part, I'm fighting a little bit, but mostly like, yo, they were respecting that I was, how I was daring to put these up. But I didn't know nothing about real graffiti. I didn't know nothing. And everybody, mostly everybody wrote their name. It, it didn't matter if it was good court graffiti or not. People were already writing their name. We hang out in a corner block somewhere, everybody just writing something. Write down their names and their girlfriend names. No one's, and you know, they have their nicknames right there. But no one's really like going out bombing, you know? Like, the only way you hang out, you put it up, you know? So it became like that, you know? 
every every corner, almost every neighborhood had popular people from the neighborhood had their names in that corner, right yeah. next to their bodega or some kind of store. You had the popular thing or the train station, like you know, if you hang out the train station. But them tags are small and we're regular Martha. And then I met someone that first told me about graffiti, and that was a guy named called Smiling on Forty Nine. I I was a Savage Scout. He was a Savage Nomad. Savage Scout, Savage Nomad was family because black, Savage Scouts were so respected. We had a lot of good company with other gangs, mm -hmm. so with a lot of respect, man. Like if they needed our help, we go help them, and and, they, and you know vice versa. That's how it became family. So Savage Scouts, Savage Immortals, Latin Diplomat, a lot of crew had a lot of goodness mm -hmm. together. But we had a lot of beef with Black Pearls, Black Spades. You know, certain so and a lot of um, uh, the Golden Guineas, and that other one, the five, I forgot the other one, Five mm -hmm. Corners, <coughs> they were bad, the oh. Italian kids from Van Ness. Oh, five I heard corners, the, the Bronx Wheelers, yeah, there was a lot of other ones we had beef with, you know, and um, yeah, and, and that's, and then Smiley, I met him, he kind of like took a liking to me, and then uh, other guy in the game, we were calling Popeye. He was doing tattoo. And he's like, hey, you draw good on the paper. You, you know, tattoo. And I was like, I was like, oh, oh, oh I, no, no, don't do me yet. I, you know, I still have a mother I respected. So I'm like, yo, chill. Yeah. And he said, no, you should learn how to do it. So I started tattooing like him. Oh. He said, look, take my thigh. And I just drew a score. He said, oh, your lines are good. I said, so I started like getting better and better and learning. And that gun was hot. The old tattoo was very hot, very mm. mean, like you're holding a, like an engine in your hand. So you had to be a real straight hand. You had to hold it. So I learned how to tattoo at that time. And I was doing tattooing for the gang, you know? So, and then Smiley's the one that told me about graffiti. And he showed me, and that's when I got a little inspired. Like, oh. So I stayed in the gang. My cousins, like, you know, my cousin, uh, Gino and Rob. They were doing their thing already, but I didn't know mostly nothing. We would go have pick, uh, family outings and barbecues and eat at the house. But I didn't really care about that, so I wanted to be tough. Mm -hmm. I want to be like my other cousin, you know? And Chino kind of didn't like my other cousin too much, but he was a he was a real street dude. You know, Chino, he was cool, but he was kind of calm, mm -hmm. you know? But Ruff, my cousin, young cousin, he was tough. So they kind of connected more. But... Um, uh, Smiley got me into it, like the little something. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So I would dibble and dabble on it. I was not really into it. So I just put up my name with mostly, uh, not really with spray paint. He had a spray paint, but not really with spray paint. With markers and a uh, paintbrush. So in the Bronx, we had a lot of rocks, a lot of rocky areas. So with a paintbrush, you just paint your shit on there. Dip it, paint, you know, it felt good. It felt like, you felt like a piano, though. It just feels. You know, you're young, you feel good, you know, you see it every day when the bus goes by, you see Sarah's go, Baby's go, SS13, or 174 Spider, and then we had the 3rd Avenue L, so we used to take the 3rd Avenue L and hang out on the 3rd Avenue L, and then went through 174 back in the days, you know, at 183rd train station, you know, the, and then under the L, you had all these, like, places where you could hang out. So there was one spot near 180th on 178 8th Street in the back there by the post office, by Starlight, you know, I mean, you know, yeah. by the bus depot, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. So we were under there and we would tie a rope on the top. It was mad high. And then we'd swing off the ledge all the way across. We, was, we had this big old <laughs> rope and we're like, woo, like tossing, you know? And it was crazy. But if you let go, the drop was maybe. 15 feet. Wow. It was deep. Because the ground goes like this, and it goes up, and then the pillars that hold the third avenue L, you know? Uh, but there's a whole deepness going. So we went up there, we was tight. Even that was. But you know, when you're young, nothing scares you. Nothing scares you. So you're climbing the metal uh, of the L, and you get all the time, you got tied. Good. Like this big, thick rope we got. And then, and then you know, you gotta go back down, you know? Or you go down the rope, but still the rope only goes a certain way. <laughs> you know, there's people that fell off that got busted up bad, but you need to swing off that rope and fight and do two ropes, and everybody's like fighting. You know, it was, you know, you know, man, it was wild style. But that was a that was a good thing. And uh, cool. 
my cousin saw that I was getting into a lot of trouble. And he was like, no, you're too, you got skills, you got girl. Oh, also I learned how to rock dance. In the in the Savage Schools and a lot of other games, they yeah. had a dance called Outlaw Rocking. Got it. Got so it was a, a dance that imitated a fight. So you had uh, two people facing each other, and you see, what will you do in a fight? Don't touch each other, there's no touching here. You just imitate what you would do in a fight. So I would like, if I box you, or I hook you, I took out a knife and cut you. Uh -huh. So it was that. Hollywood was showing me that. And he had us going against each other like that. But once you hit someone, it was like a fight. Even though that was your crew member, your gang member, your brother, it didn't matter. You're like, stop fighting. No, you touched me. And it was like, but that fight, that that was good. Because when we used to have, uh, I learned that part of outdoor dancing, right? Mm -hmm. Imitating each other, fighting against each other. And you listen to mostly uh, rock music to that. But, uh, I remember mean, we went to St. Mary's Park and to have a meeting with the bachelor. So mm -hmm. you see us young skulls walking with the leader, the big guy, and then they're going to meet with the imperial bachelors, you know, and that's their turn. So we go there just talking because it's communication also to build the, the brotherhood, you know. And everybody has each other back, even though that's their territory, we got respect. But once you got a brotherhood, you can still walk through their neighborhood with your color. You didn't have to take them out. Mm -hmm. You were brothers, man, you know. Certain places we had beef with the javelins or someone, you know, we had to be careful and not to go in there. Or else we get into a fight, we got, you know. But it was good. And one of my many times going to St. Mary's Park, mm -hmm. I bump into a, a group of guys dancing by the center. I'm like, oh, look at these guys dancing. I was just really, really, I like dancing. I grew up with them. My mother and father always kissing for me, always dance together in the house, always show us to have love for each other, mm -hmm. you know. And I see these people dancing. I'm like, oh. And it looked almost like a little salsa to me, but then a certain way. And then, you know, uh, the Latin hustle was coming and all that. They started bringing, bring, uh, the hustle dance started becoming our own flavor for the Puerto Ricans called Latin hustle. Right. And then they were mixing with this dance they were doing. It was called freestyle rocking. Now there's a dance called freestyle rocking. And I didn't know that they matter. I'm an outlaw rocker. And I meet this guy, Robert Grant, after a while, I've seen him. I said, what are you doing? He said, this is freestyle rocking. He's from Puerto Rico, straight from Puerto Rico, straight hardcore Spanish. And speaking broken English, so we communicate a little, got to talk to each other. And he said, I said, oh, I'm a dancer, I'm a dancer, right? So he saw my face, he said, yeah, but you're in a gang. He said, I'm an outlaw rock, that's hard, you know, I'm tough, you know, you want to, you know. So he goes to me, he goes to me, yeah, yeah. So you got a girlfriend? I said, yeah, I got a girlfriend. And he said, oh, oh, if you really want to get girls, you learn how to do this dance. And I went, huh? Awesome. First, the freestyle rocking. The freestyle rocking is nice. It's smooth, yeah. you know. It's smooth dancing. And he just him by himself. And sometimes he would go against other people in competition. But it was a more smoother dance, you know, through salsa music or mambo or some uh, American slow rock or something. But they, they, they had it. And then the disco started coming. With disco was around, but it's building slowly more and more. And uh, with that music... So I started learning from it. I would go in there sometimes, take off my colors, and be in a park, like a different person, and learn from him. And I met this guy named Enoch, too. And they, they became famous like club dancers, man. Very famous. That was good. All right. I want to take you back to when you first started writing. What did you use? What markers? Did you do homemade markers? And Talk to us it. about that. Yeah. And that's where the next part comes. Since I was doing so... I don't know. As a gang member, I'm doing good. But as a human, I was not doing good. So my cousin said, look, you got too much skill. You dance good. You draw <laughs> good. You got other opportunities. You're getting too bad. You're going to wind up hurting someone bad. And you're going to wind up go to jail. I don't want that for you. That's not your life. And I was angry with him because it took me almost four years. And I'm winning the gang. And I'm with the gang. And it's going to be fifth year. And I'm strong and better. And, you know... You know, I, I just loved my life in that in that game. Never brought the colors to my mother's house. Never wore that around my mother. I respect my mother. Every time I got home, I would fold it up, put it under the staircase or on the roof. We had a roof, and you got stash on the roof. Mm -hmm. so I never want to bring that to my mom. That don't got nothing to do with my mom, and that's to disrespect her, right? So now, he forced me, like, you've got to get out, or I'm going to beat the shit out of you. I said, yo, what's going on here? Now I'm lost. I'm not in the game. Even... Hollywood and them, they told me, 
you gotta be out. Uh-huh. So they, I didn't have to fight to get out again with mm-hmm. my cousin. So they just let me go. So I get out. I'm like lost kid now. I, get, I see my cousin Chena at a birthday party, a family birthday party. And I see him like with a shirt, like painted. I'm like, oh, yo, what's that? I could do that. He said, yeah, you do good for you. I said, no, but I can draw. And he said, yeah, I know you can draw, but you're not doing the gang thing. I'm like, no, no. I want to I wanna see this. So he introduced me to graffiti graffiti. Mm. And then I said, I know a guy. He said he needs to write. Or, you know, because I didn't know. Because I see him once in a while and I smile. And he goes, oh, yeah, I know Smiley. Yeah, he's a writer. I said, yeah, but he, he's an outlaw, too. He said, yeah, 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 he's an outlaw. So I was like, oh, okay. And then Chino started showing me. But when Chino started showing me, it was good. And we started bombing the buses. Like, I started thinking about graffiti. So I was trained. So when they first started the crew, it was mostly just a uh, bus crew, you know, like a tagging crew. So it, it was for um, mad tagging association, mm-hmm. right? And then when we started hitting trains, it became mad transit artists, yeah. you know? So we went from there to there. And then uh, I remember later on, Crane was trying to make a crew too, because everybody's going to the train now, and he had a crew called DAT. Uh, Destroying all trains, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, oh. And then we had Bronx Family, which was the other crew, and you know, it was like, I was like, oh, it's like in graffiti, I could get them with a lot, of, a lot of like crews, you know, like in the gang, you were gang, you had to stay with one gang, and that was your, it was family. I like that, but then I noticed like these these crews were like moving around. Mm-hmm. Graffiti crews were different. They started like moving. They could go here. They could go there. They went, and I was like, I was interested. So my cousin Chino put me on first, like just explaining to me. But while he was showing me, I met one guy that became one of my biggest inspirations. And it was a 180th train station. Mm-hmm. He passed me the first marker that I heard of. And he was right, his name was El Marco, 174. Oh. And 180th train station, it was, he was dressed like a pimp daddy. He was a black dude, pimped out, kind of toying me. He was like, you know, pimped out. Uh, he had this dope straw hat, like, I'm like, and I see him going over there, because the 180, when you go in before, they used to have a newspaper stand in the middle, and in the back, all bomb. In the front, facing the entrance to go inside the train, mm-hmm. it was where he sold the newspaper. But in the back, it was just a big blank wall, you know, just everybody, you saw every, and I'm like, oh man, and I see this guy go, I said, hey, what's that, what you doing? He was like, what you doing, kid, what you want? I said, oh, that's, I do that. I do that writing. I write. Yeah, there's no graffiti word really for that. Right. You know? So I said, I write. I do that. And he said, what do you do? I said, I'll show you. So I took the head. And since I still have my game name, it was 174 spot. I did that. 174. He said, oh, yeah, you got to like, get more flow. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know. I just write 174 spot. You saw his tag with this top hat thing. It's like marks all around. You know, you're like, they start, I noticed that. With him, I started learning about the tag style, how they decorate their tag. Their signature became a style all alone. Mm-hmm. If they make the E, you make a regular E going like this, right? No, they take that E, and one square would be long, and then curved over, and you're like, w- what's that? And then he's like, style. You got to put style. You got to have some style in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your tag, in your hit. And I'm like, I, 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 I. so I started hanging out with him. He said, there's a writer's bench upstairs. I started hopping the train almost every day after school, and I go there. And I met another legend. His name was Super Coot. I swear to God, this guy was a twin tower to me. I was still a small kid. I, even to this day, he's still a giant to me. Because this guy was mad tall. I swear, he was been, for me, I felt like he was seven feet tall. When I looked at him, I said, like, holy snap. So I met him. And when I met him, it was like, and he was like, something came on the train. <laughs> like, yeah, you're going to see something. You're going to see something. <laughs> That's what I need to say. I said, oh, man. Oh, I, I felt, like, excited. So I started meeting writers there. And that bench in 180th was kind of different. Because that bench had a lot of whites there, too. Whites okay. in 180th. Yeah. So a lot of white writers from uptown or that right. area okay. were there, not in the bench downtown, really. Okay. In the bench, we had 149th Street in Grand Carl, mm-hmm. mostly black and Puerto Ricans. Yeah, some whites, ones in the blue, but not like uptown. Because there's still racist things going on. So it was not, you know, even though writers got along, that bench was like, right? It was like, that area right there was not like, 
for everybody, you know. You had right hang out there, comment with gold ones on, but some that got down with other respected crews got respect. Right. So this right is like comment and Billy One Sixty Seven. That was my next mentor. But those were the guys that got down with all black crews because of their style and their reputation as writers. Right. Because kind of when you're a writer, you didn't think about races. It started becoming about skills and mm -hmm. style. Everybody started hanging out. You got the Puerto Rican, the black, the whites, everything, all kinds of white, the Italian, the Irish, and whatever, hanging out together. The Albanians hanging out, writing graffiti together. Okay. Now this is like feeling a different world of unity, and it was nice. And since I came from that part where my father died, I didn't think about that certain kind of race anymore. But after I met a guy named Billy167, that was the next step. I needed something more than my cousin. My cousin was a good graffiti writer, but he was not good with his letters as much. There was other writers who were more advanced. Mm -hmm. And when I met Billy 167, he was an Irish writer. He's the one that put me on to style. He taught me how to flow, how to move my letters. And it was amazing. But during the same time, as well, I, at the time, I got into beef one. Mm -hmm. And I befriended a guy named El Dorado Mike. He was from 169 and Claremont. Because once I got a fight, it was not my neighborhood no more. Once I was in a gang member no more, it was not my neighborhood no more. Now the neighborhood was the Bronx. Meaning I could ride my bike anywhere. As long as I had my knife, there was a popular knife back in the day when you were a kid. It was called a K-55 knife. That was the knife to have. That's the knife to protect yourself. So I had the K-55 knife. And yeah, I had that night to protect me if I had to get more than a couple of guys to fight. I could fight with my hand, but sometimes that days was wicked days. You never know. So I had the K-55. I would go anywhere. I'd go to white neighborhood. i just see things. But when a white group would come near me, I knew already. So i get on my bike and get going. Mm -hmm. Because there's no talking in, in Pelham Parkway, in Van Ness area, Morris Park. There's no talking there. You don't belong there. You're not supposed to be there. Why not? But then you know why. You gotta know the history. So you gotta have, have like, look, I'm not gonna be stupid. Because that could be my last day in that neighborhood. So, but with graffiti, it opened up a new world. Right. And when I met Billy, first he, he chumped me in the beginning. You know? It was in the winter, 75, and then he's like telling me, oh, come, come meet me. At first I met him, he was painting along the walls of 180th Street, Street train station. You know the war, that long war that goes all the way across? Billy was doing a piece of it. And that was the neighborhood I used to live. So I had some old friends that used to still live in that neighborhood, so I went to visit them one day. After staying in his house late, I went back to walk to 175th at Hall Avenue. And, uh, and I see someone painting it. It's like 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, oh, shit. So I'm looking at the guy. And I don't know what to do. Like, go to him or don't do it. So I just watch him. And then he finished, I see the graffiti, the same thing that my cousin is doing, everybody's doing. So he leaves. And I'm like, oh man, I went home, I said, I should have asked him something. But I didn't know, you don't know how they're gonna turn out. Mm -hmm. It was late, so I went home. Then the next day I was around riding my bike, and I saw him there taking pictures with Can 3, a other writer. Pill 170, a other writer. I'm like, so I go over to them, hey, hey, what are you guys doing? Hey. I saw you. I think I saw you last night. But you know, I can't recommend him completely, but I said, yeah, I saw you. He said, yeah, you saw me? I said, I saw you painting here. He said, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. I painted. this. So I said, yo, you could teach me? And he said, oh, I don't know. I said, I know Elmo. I started naming names. You know, you got your props like that. He said, you know, super cool. I said, I know him. I know Elmo. My cousin is El Chino. Yeah, yeah. All right, come meet me at uh, Bronx Park, East Park. And that's where Billy and them used to hang out with Hippie 44 and the Crazy Five used to hang out yeah. in the park one at one time. Either there or we go to Brook Avenue. So I went there. And it's like, you know, winter started coming. It was cold up day. And I would go to the park, wait for him in the bench. He'd tell me, wait. He never came. The last day, Friday, <coughs> he came to me. And that's when he said, hey, you ready? I came with my school notebook. Because back in the days, I didn't have a black book. I had my school notebook with my pieces in it. Mm -hmm. And that was my black book back in the days. You know the old one with the black and white? Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the composition book? 
Yeah, yeah, I know you know. <laughs> you can't rip the pages out. Right, right. You rip the pages, the other ones are gonna start coming out. <laughs> yeah. You go, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was my black book. So my schoolwork was like this little bit, and the whole back was like all like pieces. And you know, my cousin told me about designer markers, about pearl paint, and all these other things. Mm -hmm. So when I went to see Billy, I was there with my school. So every day I would go there and say, "Oh, this guy's he playing me." Like, he, he, he's, you know, playing around with me. So I got angry. So the day I saw him, he came finally after school on a, on a Friday. I saw him, but I, 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 my memory was like, you know, they, oh, after a while, the white kids all looked the same to me. They had all long hair. They dressed with the denim. So I'm like, is this him? And he came in and said, and you know, Billy, he's a very soft, soft great person, very nice. But you don't know the person that much yet. But he's like, you're the kid I met in one of I said, yeah, yeah, I've been waiting for you, wife. I got angry. I said, hey, easy, easy. I got to make sure. I saw you coming. I came around. You saw me coming up for? I just want to see if you really were going to come. You're dedicated. I said, I want to. I am dedicated. Look at my book. And he looked at me and said, oh, oh, I see you. All right. Yes, I felt good. He's shaking his head. And after that, he took me under his wing. And I got down with him. I didn't think about no more about what happened to my father, racism. I just said, yo, this guy is too nice. And he brought me to his house. His parents gave me potatoes and, and, and beef. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, because I wish he a lot of potatoes. And, yeah. and yo, like the first day I got a meal? I'm like, oh, oh snap. I'm, I, I'm still young. You, you know, and I'm like, yo, I ate that shit. I'm hungry all the time. And, you know, we got food, but we ate, like 10 kids getting fed at the time. You know? Yeah. So... I took that meal, and you know, when you got a meal, you got a meal, so I ate, and then he said, he said, we got to go tomorrow to Pearl Paint and get you a real book, you need a black book, I said, I'll get one, show me a store, he said, what do you mean you're going to get one, I'll get one, just tell me, what happened, yeah. he showed me the black book, and then his books were amazing, they had all this color, characters, I'm like, I was like, oh, and what I noticed, he was using a character from a comic book we used to look at, called Mad, Mad Comics. So he had, yeah, so he had some of the characters from there. I'm looking in there. I'm like, oh, snap. And then some of the backgrounds he was doing was from album covers, you know? So I'm like, looking at all the stuff that he had. I'm like, this album, this black book is amazing. I need to have this. And that's when I went. I started racking more. I always racked up right. for food and, and stuff for my mom to help my mom with her bills when my father died. And, um, uh, uh, Stealing chicken and whatnot from the supermarket back mm -hmm. in the days, and we had yeah. popular stores called K more I mean, Corvettes, Corvettes, Woolworths, uh, all them stores was a place where I had to become like t for my survival. I rack up clothes and Alexander's on mm -hmm. Morton Road and Third Avenue. You got to steal clothes, not not because you wanted it was a you a must because my mother didn't have much money, so to have clothes I would rack up even clothes for my younger brothers and sister. Right. And bring them like a gift. I don't know, I felt good. You ever heard of Robin Hood, right? Everybody knows about Robin Hood, so everybody's trying to be a Robin Hood too. Like, you're bad, but you want to be good a little bit. So when I was working, sometimes I thought about my little brothers and sisters, you know? You got to think about your family too, you know? Right. I went back up for them. My big brother and sister were trying to help me out. So how can I help them too? So I did the advice and verse. Yeah, I got into graffiti. It was... Uh, El Marco gave me my first El Marco marker. Got it. And uh, they taught me about the Buffalo markers. That was the main thing to fill in. And the designer markers. And like these, these you have to go to like really good art stores to get these things. Not like a cheap like Woolworths or something. You had to go. And that's when I learned to be more and more into pearl paint, sand flax, and um, shipments on Fordham. And you know, go racking. And you know, that, you know, I'm not proud to say I'm, I'm robbing and stealing, but I got to do it. And I did it, and I, I became a good writer. And I started becoming known for my style a little more and more and more. And the thing about that whole thing, too, like uh, the buses, we used to hit the buses a lot. But the buses was also I felt because since I got good, I was good with doing the piecing style, the bubble style, and I got good with the tag style. After a while, I love it all. So a lot of people are like, oh, don't waste your time in the insides, mm -hmm. in the inside train. But I love the insides too. It was all about the ink. That was our other mission. All right, you're gonna do the piece of the train. You set up your colors. You gotta rack a certain color. Or sometimes you couldn't rack up your main color. 
Sometimes you had to just get colors, you know? Sometimes you couldn't be picky when you're racking. We right. try to be picky, but you can't all the time, you know? So you get the best colors you can at the time. And um, and since I like to hit the insides, I learned about writing. I met Stay High. And I met, I started, like I told you, I didn't stay in one place. So I started moving around. I started hanging out in Harlem a lot to my, with my cousin. They lived in Jefferson Projects. So I got them in, in, into the beat. They were two years younger than me. So they, they liked it, the cars. They went to cars. So I get in with my graffiti and one had Trans Am. So <laughs> Trans Am, so he wrote TM 112 for the street. And then my other cousin, like Firebird, so he wrote FB 112. So them names stand for Firebird and Trans Am. They would pop the cars back in the days. And them guys were like, yo, 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 yeah. So we would go hitting around. And then I met one guy, and he was a cool dude. I met him on um, Madison Avenue. He was tagging Snake 131. He told me there's a big writer's bench over there. Manhattan Bill area. And I went over there one day and I met this guy that I saw, I haven't seen in years, I saw him not too long ago in the feet. Spade 130, Tree 127. Mm -hmm. and then I met Knee High 161. Got it. And Knee High 161 said, Yo, kid, you're cool. And he said, let me see. Let's go to the store. So I went to the store. I told him, yo, what do you like to drink? He said, what, you going to get me something? I said, what do you like to drink? He said, yeah, get me a Colt 45 or something. I went there and racked up the quartz. And I gave him, like, to show him respect. And he said, oh, dude, you know, I'm going to take you somewhere. Uptown, you ever heard of WC-188? I said, what? He said, WC-188. I said, I don't know that shit. He said, let's go. We got on the H-Train. I don't be on that side so much. The A train felt like gigantic. Compared to a two and a five train, those yeah. trains mm -hmm. were like big. Big and they look stronger than the two and the five trains. The IRT, yo, I'm on that train, I'm like, whoa. And we're taking that train, and then he goes, come on, let's hang out in the middle. The middle was like a, a big booth. You can hang out. It was like these angles that went down, and you could just hang out in, in between the cars. It wasn't like the two and the five, you were squished. It was like and you know, to the point, sometimes we'd be like four or five people in that little piece. But when you went there, you could fit more than ten people. Right? You know, you, yeah. the old train, you had all this space. And it was beautiful. I'm like, holy snap. I felt like I was going like upstate New York. I was like, <laughs> yeah, where we're going. Then we go in there, and he ride it. So I met his boy, Stitch One. But then Stitch said, he seen me before. And then he was a savage nomad too. He said, I think I met you through Smiley. I'm like, oh, snap. I didn't know you wrote. He said, yeah, I write. And that's when I felt like more close to him. So I started hanging out with Stitch a lot. Mm -hmm. And tried to learn more from him. Wow. And Nehi. And Nehi was the man, man. And see, uh, um, Stitch being Puerto Rican, Dominican. Uh, Nehi Black. Everybody's brothers there. So, and a lot of Hispanic writers up there. Mostly all Hispanic. I met Chrome 100, King 5 from up there. You know? So, now I learned that, oh, snap, they writing all the way. Even though I was watching Heights, Heights mm -hmm. Manhattan, but it felt like, man, I felt like I was way, way, way far. Like, I felt like it was forever to get up there sometimes. And then, you know, stuff like that. And then, like, what I'm trying to say, when I got into, like, with Chino Mala, mm -hmm. I, I met, um, El, I mean, um, El Dorado Mike. I met him, right? I met him, befriended him at a block party. The guy started rock dancing. He said, yo, you know about this? And I said, what? He went on the floor and did some move. And I said, holy snap, what's that? And that's the beginning of Break going dance. off. Right, right. Yeah, beat boom. And I'm like, what the hell is this? So I'm in the block party, and he, I see these other guys. He starts introducing me to people. He said, yo, these guys are some of the best in the neighborhood. Right. They go by the nigga twins. Oh, yeah. I'm like, who's this guy? Keith and what? Keith Kevin what? Huh? I'm like confused. You see them, you're like double vision. Like, all right. And then they get down. They doing. They don't get down. They were not getting down. They did mostly just top. Right. Top. But El Dorado was the next generation going down to the ground. You know? But these guys did mostly top. And I met them. So El Dorado Mike tells me, yo, um, you know about Cool Herc? You know about this? I said, no. The only thing I know about anything with people jamming in the park right. was Disco King Mario. Right. I'm that side of the Bronx. Yeah. 
So he's like, no, no, up the hill here. You know, we're claiming on it, then up the hill, you're on the west side. So I'm like, yo. So he said, you can't really go. They do a party for older people. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, yeah. But one day he called my house and he said, Bomb, Cool Herb's doing it in the park. Anyone could go. And that was it. I went there, went to the park, and I met a lot of people that became my friends to this day. And uh, to make the, that story long, long story short, his best friend, he told me, Bomb, you want to come practice me? I said, yeah. So he said, I'm going to come introduce you to my other boy. And the other two homies, he took me to 63 Park. And that was phase two. Wow. A name that I know about from graffiti, but n didn't know nothing. And he was telling me, we're going to go practice, dance. How did I know this writer was a dancer? Right. So I'm not, I couldn't put it uh, yet until he said, he said, yeah, this is my friend Ronnie. I'm like, oh, oh. And he goes, he goes, oh, yeah. But he goes by phase two. I said, oh. I'm like, phase two, I know that name. I couldn't get it. And then I said, mm -hmm. So we practiced, and I said, hey, you, you write the graffiti? I write graffiti, you know, writing. And then he said, he said, yeah. And then he said, how do you know not anything wrong? I said, my cousin Chino Mama. And this is before I met Billy at the time. And that's when I got the connection with him now. And then I met Cisco Kid. Now he was the other writer. So now these guys are my B-boy mentors and my also my graffiti mentors. And he took me in, Faith. He was a loving dude. He's kind of quiet too. Mm -hmm. He's like suspicious kind of character. He's like, you don't talk to him. He likes his art dude to talk to him, his style yeah. dude to talk to But people said, oh, Bob, hip hop didn't come out until, wait, that was 1980 or something. I said, no. To me, hip hop was always around. Because I saw these guys, the way they dress, their, their swagger, their flavor, their, it was completely different what Puerto Rican was doing because Puerto Rican had different flavor. Right. These guys had different flavor and swag and ain't even talk. You know the slang I'm talking about, Butch? You know? So you start seeing something different that was outside your place. I, I think. And I was like, yo, yeah. and he taught me and I started rolling with him. And, you know, he started doing flyers for people. He Crazy. became famous for doing flyers. Right. For party goers. And that's why people don't understand. Hip hop could be hip hop, but hip hop could never be hip hop without the writers. There you go. If it wasn't the writers that gave the attention where the party was at now, before they would write scruple scrap on a piece of paper, on a regular yeah. loose leaf paper, on little cards here. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, right. you know, it was nice. I didn't get it. Oh, yeah, there's a party. Yeah, we go meet a girl there. You no, know, all right. But no, not until like phase two got into it and started doing just handmade or drawing. Got it. Then from the handmade, you started getting into more like, you know, because. They always had content club, other clubs downtown. Other, then you had the like real like flyers that came printed out. He was like, he put his idea into it. He put graphic design into graffiti. Right. And he started working on it. And yeah. me knowing him and uh, Buddy Esquire, another famous flyer master, um, and Cisco Kid, they were on demand. So when Face got busy, he was running out of some supplies. So he was like, boom. What's up? What's up? What are you doing? I said, no, nah, I'm going to go back up. And see if they got any leather set. I said, what? He said, the leather set. I need the leather set. I said, what's that? And then I saw him when, when I used to be in his house. And Buddy, too. How they rub it off. I'm like, you need that? He said, all right, I'm going to see if I can get that. So when you go to the store, now you're going, not where the paint and markers are. Now you got to go to a different department. And you're walking in there, so like, and they look at you like, can you have, can I help you? And you're like, no, no. And you're like, Waiting for that quiet time, you like see it, and you finally find it. Sometimes you had to pull it out, these uh, um, drawers, mm -hmm. these drawers, and they had these sheets of letters set out, and letters, and you got to find the one he needs. If it's Cooper, or hell of it, you know, there's different typesets, so you had to like, now this is like, this is homework to me, for my OGs, for my mentors, it's homework. I'm like reading, and I open it, look at the style, oh yeah, this is it. Now I got to put it down, and I got to walk around the store again to make sure no one's watching me. Now I go back when it's quiet. Rack up. Put it under my thing. Yo, the first lesson I learned, the first day I started racking that, mm -hmm. not to have the facing on your body. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, I got it on my stomach and everything. So yeah. I got it on here. The other sheets were okay, but the first one was all stuck because it, it, it went with my sweat. You know, my sweat. And I, because he, even if you're, you're thinking, you're getting nervous, you're like, you don't want to get busted, so your body gets a little heated up. So it's on my skin, 
and, and you know why? So I, the first time I came, I was like, yeah, yeah, I got it. When I got to it, the thing was stuck on my stomach. I had the number one on me, so I had numbers. And then I told him, I said, yo, and he's like, oh, that's a good stack. He's like, get it? And I'm going to give you like four or five dollars. And he was like, because in the beginning, he wasn't getting paid. Then when he got in the band, they started paying him. So they all getting paid. And then Pooh 2 started doing it. It's the other guy. He started doing it. So they all asked me. So I'm now making money from all of them. But it's like a brotherhood work, you know? So I'm getting money for racking up leather set and a white Pentel marker. Right. And white out. You remember white out? Mm -hmm. White out? So I needed stuff like that. So I was like racking that up. Anything I could get, leather set, sand flags, shipments, I was racking that. Now I had a job and I had to rack up for my hobby, which was writing. And for for stuff to sell and for like for my right. mentor, you know. So yeah, and people don't talk about it, but that's an important thing to know in life because them guys are making money with it. Mm -hmm. They need a letter set because there's no other way to put it down. Right. Once you did the final one, we go to the library. And Faith was teaching me how to do flies. You go to the library, you put in the, the five cent, and then you got the machine, and you get the oh shit. And we like, but you know some library. They didn't have good people. Some of them had had uh, kind of waxy, like not good people, but then he had cut. It was in the beginning for him. Then he found a spot where he could get it done. Mm. That was at 126. Nice. But as being a poor b-boy, my boy Eldorado Mike, they loved me. I was getting to be a good b-boy dancer, right? And Eldorado Mike, he was a, everybody knows him in the hood. Mm -hmm. He's from the 9. He's a very popular place in the Bronx, too. It was a place where you don't go. Not anyone's welcome there. The nine is, a, you know, it's the Paul Rock guys. So he gets there, and El Dorado Mike blows up selling drugs. Blows up. He passed away. I miss him a lot. But, but instead of being a greedy drug dealer by himself, he brought stuff to the community. He did block parties. He bought all the food. He started doing things for the kids in the neighborhood. And for me... As being one of his mentors, he started buying me clothes from A.J. Lester. If you know about A.J. Lester, that was a place to go to in Harlem. So El Dorado Mike started making money for the drug. Started dressing more fresh. But me, I was a poor b-boy. When I would go dance in the beginning, we would go to a Cool Herc's party or El Dorado Mike, I mean, uh, um, Disco King Mario or the other parks or schoolyard jams. I didn't really have the same much clothes. I had the same clothes. So if I had one clean jean, like Lee's, I kept that. I only had one good pants and one good top. I, I kept that shit like mint. It was not for school. It was, it was only to go to somewhere. So, but I, it was getting boring. Had the same clothes, same thing. But when I would go to the gym before I had that, I was really like this broken up kid. But they looked at me and said, "No, well, you have a skill. You have a skill." Don't worry. So I would go to the park jam, and they would have a circle. And I, they'd go, go ahead, you're going to go dance against this guy. I said, no, boy, that guy looks fresh. Yeah, definitely. Before we, we go into your b-boy world, because it's expensive. You you are very well-rounded. We want to make... Yeah, I got to stop this. <laughs> no, we want to make sure that... Butch has some more graffiti questions. No, no, no. Let's do that. You know? No, and then I'm we're gonna right get... there with you, my man. Yeah, I'm right there. No, because, you know, when you did everything at one time, you can see this kid that talk about now, oh, oh, they talk about back in the days, oh, I saw graffiti. But then you saw graffiti in 1976, but why did you start in 1981? Right. Okay, you saw a beat boy in 1978, right. but why you start in 1985? I don't understand that. When you grew up in the Bronx or in that area... You know, I'm just saying, when you grow up with something, you know, like, I'm a drummer, too. My white friends, they were into rock. They were drummer. I want to learn how to rock. I, yo, I played the drums. Yo, whatever someone was willing to teach me, I'm going to take. Because right. what is there? As a kid growing up, there's nothing much to do but learn things. And I learned how to play guitar. I learned how to play uh, um, the drums. And the kind of the drums I got involved more because dumb kids. But when I was a b-boy and learning funk, I started saying, oh, can I learn how to drum break, how to do the drum break for um, um, James Brown songs? Because that was a big, uh, everything from James Brown was popular for like, mm -hmm. yeah. dancing. You know, so if I could learn Apache and other songs with, like Just Be Gone from Jimmy Cash, you know, you get these things, you're like trying to get that. Now, you, now it's like rock, you're learning rock beats, and then you're learning 
What? Funk. And now, and then after that, you bring it to your coach, Sasa. You know how to do something like just that, 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 that. So all right, we're going you know? ready to flip it. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, what other tags have you written? And do you still write any of them? Yeah, my tag started from my game name, 174. 174 Spider. And then my first graffiti name was from my movie I saw at the time. It was called Spartacus. Yeah. With Kirk Douglas. And I love how he was strong in that movie. And I wanted to be that strong guy, too. Not in a gang way, now in a writing world way. So I got Spartacus. But the name was too long. I was like, Spartacus, I was like, yeah, that thing too. So I cut it down to Spar. S-P-A-R-T, 174. And I got that name. And after I got that name, it felt good. I had the name. But then I started noticing at the time, Miss Seventy, a lot of writers were replacing letters for characters. Okay. So I was like, oh, and most of the guys they were doing was guys that had like maybe A's or O's, but mostly O's. They would put character face up or something. I was like, oh, I need a name with an O. So I started like looking. Now I got, I said, oh, Barnum, I want to be Barnum. I told Billy, Barnum. And he was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's good. So I, you know, so I practiced on that one. But when I went to see my cousin Chino, like, yeah, I'm going to be Barnum. He was like, wait, wait, wait. I go to school with Barnum 1. I wait, what? It's a bomb? That thing shrunk on me. I'm like, huh? So he said, yeah. I said, well, my cousin went to uh, art and design. I went to music and art. So I'm like, what? Oh, man, man. He said, no, no. But come, you guys used to go there after school and meet him after school over there and meet some writers from him. So I met Barnum 1. So he's like, oh, I'm kind of quitting. It's going slowing down. He's telling me, like, I could pass you the name. You know what? You can write the name. I said, I can write the name? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, if I didn't say I can pass it to you, I can pass it. So I asked Chino. He said, yo, when the other writer, original name, gives it to you, you can use it. But then he kept on writing it. But I was like, you know, I'm like, yeah, so I'm in the Bronx with this name Bomb. And I go, to, I go to Smart. I, no, I did the Bomb pieces first. And then I told Billy about, I told Billy and Smiley about Bomb 1. And they're like, ah, man, but you could be Bomb 2. I no fucking way. No, 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 no. You guys, phrase, everybody telling me about being original. You got to be the first of the first. No, 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 no. I said, no. Well, I'm going to be Bomb 2. Nah. I didn't like it. I was like, nah, bomb one in there, I'm second. Nah, nah, nah. I, I was like, no, I'm not going to be no bomb. I'm not going to be bomb. And so Billy said, ah, oh, B, so what are you going to do? I said, I look for other name. He said, Toe, other name. I was like, nah, Toe, I ain't going to write Toe. Uh, you know? So I was, like, yeah, I was like, no, no, no. So he was like, ah, oh, you know, you can just do it, man, because you got nice, man. You learn my B, so it's like, you got good Bs, man. Then we see Butch name on the train too. So B, masses of B's, you know? Butch, Billy, you know? Bob, yeah, yeah Bob. Junior. Oh, Big 149, Junior yeah. Big. No, oh, Big 149. Ray. Yeah. But more mechanical. Yeah. Was Butch. Meaning a more harder style. Than Butch B. Billy had nice style, but wild style. Bubble style. Swampy. It was mm -hmm. dope. So these combinations from him. And Billy formulated me. And that's what I love. So now, I'm, in a girl, I'm with my girlfriend in the library. She has to do a book report. We're in the library. She's doing it. I, I'm waiting for her. Let me go get the dictionary. I get the dictionary. Ah, let me put a name with an O in it. Man. Then I go on the bomb again. I'm looking at bomb. I'm like, bomb. Mm. But and then parentheses is B-O-M. I'm like, what is that B-O-M? Oh, the other B is a silent B. Oh, that's my knee. Ah, there you go. There it is. What? Billy goes, what? <coughs> bum, bum, boom, bum. I said, bum, motherfucker. Because yeah. it's a silent B. It's really bomb. You don't really hear the other B. Bomb. You don't hear the other B. He's like, are you smarter than I thought? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I start running around. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was excited now to hit the train with that bomb. So I'm doing black books, getting the style together. And then Chino's like, oh, but he gave you the name. No, no, I'm bomb now. Yeah, but don't look right. No, I don't give a fuck. You got to be strong with what you believe in. So I took it. So the year I got that name was um, um, in the beginning of um, January 1976. So I started writing 76 for the year. 
Yeah, I go Psalm 76. Psalm 76. Little did I know that 76 became a popular time in graffiti because it was the bicentennial yeah, year. Yeah. So everybody in their mother was trying to put up 76 in it. But I felt good because now it's part of my name. So Bond 76 is going to be always Bond 76. You know? Only one time or two times I wrote Bond 1. Like, I just wanted, because also, my mentors, some of them had the ones, had a scoopy mm-hmm. Roman number one. And I liked it, that flavor. So I said, Bond 1. But they look good together. That B-O-M and then that one going like that. I like doing it, but it didn't, it don't look good together. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh, let me stick with the bottom 76. So I still with that. So like my birthday month was like May. And I still with that. Doing little pieces in there. Sometimes we even piece in the Amtrak with Smiley. Right. Me, Smiley, Ken would go to Amtrak, smoke weed. And they do the other thing. And we'd be painting the walls of the Amtrak. It had a lot of walls down there. But we go to Hamburg Courts. And then Katona Park back in the days, we had 21 Hamburg Courts. This shit was a Hall of Fame in there. And you want to talk about Hamble Courts. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Hamble Courts, the Hamble Courts, the Hamble Courts. You know how many pieces and burgers and style? That was almost like looking at the train at the bench. You go there, you saw pieces. Oh, man. I go there with Ruff. I go there with Chino. I go there with Best 149. I go there with Cash. You know? There were so many writers in the neighborhood all painting at the Hamble Court. And that was the next part, too. It was a beautiful part. So... I, I had the name Bomb. So I got Bomb 76. Bomb 76. Then the next part was where the five comes from. The five don't come from my favorite number. It don't come from the five train. It don't come from no five barrel. It don't come from nothing but this. Right. What right. took care of me in the hood? I was good at fighting. I was a fighter. And I could fight. So someone just said, I don't know yeah, you drop people like a bomb, like we were talking about um, Japan, the atomic bomb. You, you, I see you fight in school, you're always not, yo, you're good, man. So I was into boxing too. So they were like, you be dropping people like a bomb. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one day I was at home, and I was just, after I came out the uh, training, and I was like just thinking about it, and I saw my hand, I said, oh, this protects me. Five fingers make a fist. That's bomb five. And that's how the name stood. From 76 on, that was my name. There you go. Now, I was only lie, I sometimes put 76, but it was the five. Cool. And then, I loved James Bond movie, so I had 005. Ah. And then later on, I had a beef with the other writer called Ian 005, but we became friends. But we had a little beef. Oh, who was first? I right, right. beef, both beef. But yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. All right. The next, uh... Which stations did you get into for layups? Oh, boy. Oh, so many. So many. And they had underground layups, the sixth layup, you know, um, St. Lawrence, two, 223rd, 225th. Um, Sometimes they lay it up in um, Bronx Park East. Going to Pelham Parkway, uh, yeah, for the Bronx. And then we had 183rd, we had Burnside, uh, yeah, we had Kingsbridge. I went to Kingsbridge many times with MG Boys, I got down with them. Uh, yeah, yeah, the layups, yeah. But I, I even went to like layups on the Seven Line, Junction Boulevard. Right. I, because <coughs> that's the other thing, my story, like I said, don't stay in the Bronx. Early on in the mid 70s, I was traveling. So I started going to the different writers' bench in Queens, in Brooklyn. I befriended one guy. Uh, his brother had passed away, Stim One. Who was that legend? Was it Rocco? Rocco One? That was a six train. Now, Stim One was uh, Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who else? He had a brother. And not only that, not only that, when I got into hip hop, you know, in the beginning when you don't call it hip hop, I met an other writer that was famous. He wrote flowers because my cousin lived on 175th on Hillside, Jamaica, Queens. So I used to go over there bringing them while I was learning from the Bronx. And they said, Yo, someone's doing a jam today. It was a Saturday. So I went. And it was Grandmaster Flowers. He was a big disco DJ. But he helped bring like 
the records to the people that got involved with the hip hop. Like DJ S'mores and Disco Twins from Queensbridge. So I started hanging out there. And I met I met uh, Flowers and he was a writer. So he brought me to that, you know. He said and when I met him, I said, Oh, we were talking about it. He saw my shirt. I had a shirt with the letters on it. And he's like, Oh, what are you doing with that? I'm like, oh, I'm a b-boy, you know? And it was it was dope. And he was like, Yeah, yeah. And I said, Yeah, and I'm a writer too. He said, I write. I said, Who are you write? Flowers, B. From Brooklyn. What? Since he's a DJ, he went everywhere with the DJ. He was popular. Mm-hmm. And I met DJ Pete Jones through him. Pete DJ big, Jones. Yeah. You know? So these are legends. Like people, if they see it, they understand. They really know what right. I'm talking about. But we went through all that, and you know, I just wrote different layups. I knew different writers. I got down with many different crews in different boroughs. You know, got from it. Brooklyn, Queens, even Long Island. Hanging out there in um, Long Island and Staten Island. In the 70s, with Ren, my boy Ren and them. They were famous writers. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right, well, talk us through getting into and out of your most challenging or dangerous tunnels or yard. Well, first of all, in the beginning, it wasn't so dangerous. Okay. The only danger for the cops. You know, like, basically, in the beginning, it was a walking. It, it was kind of not so, so bad. Like, later, it became when they got the more vandal squads coming. You remember Bumpy? Bumpy and the other guy that used to be in 180. Uh, Bumpy and... Ricky and Skin. No, no, before them, guys. Swartz. 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 The other guy. We, we used to be on, on 180 hangout. He would come and b- bother us. Yo, yo, get on the train. You gotta get on the train. You not get out the station. Like, oh, no, I'm waiting for someone. No, you've been here too long. You've been here too long. You gotta get off the station. So Swartz... Bumper, bumpy, big black dude, cop, they always push us out. So one day, I remember an incident, I was there, and they started getting loud with Super Cool. And Super Cool didn't want to hear it. Right. So you cry, oh, they only touch me. <coughs> right? They say, no, Super Cool punched the dude, bump, and ran down the stairs and disappeared. But this dude was big, and one idiot was a police station. Mm-hmm. But to see this guy run, he was fast and big. And he, he just said, the next time I saw him, he told me, when I called his house, he was like, yo, I'm good. I got away. They got me. I'm like, they, but they couldn't do nothing to me. I was, was a young kid. And they were like, oh, you know that guy. I said, I don't know him. And they said, you were weird. I'm like, I don't know him. I don't know him. And to this day, I still talk to Wendell about that. Sweet. But he's a great writer, too. He's a great writer. And he's a power. He was a power on the two and the five. Meaning, when I say power, he was like an enforcer. If you're down with him, he ain't playing. It's like the six. You mm-hmm. had Kindle. You had Rip One. Those guys were the enforcers. They wrote, they were legends, but they were enforcers. They go with other popular writers to get help them get up. And they had their back. God. They were the force, man. That guy Rip One was no joke, man. I know. Right? 168. But I like to call him Rip One, that was his name, dude. He rips. Yeah. So you you ever had any good chase scenes though? Out, out the out the yard or off the yeah. land? Yeah, you know, Esplanade. Oh, yeah, I forgot to name Esplanade. That was one of my favorite layups. But that was a layup that goes, is an underground tunnel layup and an outdoor yeah. layup. So that was a, that was one of, the, one of the best, too. But I got raided in there. In 1978, I started teaching my little brother. And, you know, got his name, got him the name Bane. Mm. Before that, we, I had chase stories, you know. But I tell you this story because I brought him in into, the, into the game, you know. And we went there. And when you go right with your brother, now you like worry about him. Right. So we're piecing, we're all piecing. He's trying to get his peace. We're like getting all together, doing the outline like this. And then that day had to be the day they want to do a full force raid, meaning cops came all over the place. And me. I'm like, yo, I have to worry about this kid. So then we had wars we could go to. Outside stickouts, there's wars that you could go and then try to lean and, and jump off. So we had to do it like that. We, they came in, everybody scattered. Cops! Cops was everywhere. Okay, they knew the writers, so they're coming from this end, this end. So everybody's running, scattered, some getting busted. I was with uh, I was with Kilo from the sixth line. I was with 
Race one. I'm gonna do a couple things. Now, now, we're all scattered. So I'm running with my brother, like, go, go, go. And he's like trying to run. And I'm like more faster than him, like, go, go, go. And the cops are coming. So we go to the edge and say, we gotta go through it. Go through the bushes. Now I'm going to an overpass where the train goes down the pipe. Yeah. So I said, you gotta jump. You gotta, you gotta jump. Go lead and jump. <laughs> and he jumped. Now I had to go. It's kind of a long drop, but we made it and we were out. You know? But the most horrifying time I had was also in Espadar. It was only that the stickouts wasn't long that day. The stickouts wasn't long. I'm doing graffiti with my boy Sid and everybody. And we got chased, right? We got raided. And I, I decided to get on top of the train. And I got on top of the train inside. And when it came out to the tunnel, I got on top. I thought I could run out. But the layup was short that day. So the train was short. And now I'm on top of the train. The cops are looking at me to chase me. So I continue. And there was no way, nothing else to do. And they were coming on the side. I jumped off. I popped my knee. But somehow, I made it back to Bronx Park East. Because wherever we go painting in that area, we always made Bronx Park East where we're going to meet to see if everybody's okay. We meet at Bronx Park East. So after that, I jumped off. Plus, pop! I heard something pop. I'm like, oh. And I, I had to get away, so I kept going. Got to the wall. Still jump off the wall. After I jumped off the wall, in my pants, I just saw it was tight in that area. And I was like, so I'm limping, and I get to the park, and I pull down my pants, because I was scared. And they were like, yo, bro, what happened? I got one. And, yo, know, to this day, my knee, yo. Know, so I get there, and I, I had pulled down my pants, and that knee was the same as my thigh. Mm. I'm like, oh. And um, so after that, I get to the, they said, oh, you gotta go to the hospital. I, go, I can't go to the hospital now. At like 2 in the morning, we have parents. I went home, I, I tried ice it. It got messed up because it took me long. The day the blood got in it, it got messed up. Mm. So from that day, for almost 20 years, for maybe 40 years, I had water in my knees because of that. And the bone still sticks out. So I still got that. But, you know, I still b-boy, but I had problems over time. Yeah. I had to stop dancing. I had, but I never wanted to get the knee replacement. They don't. They told me, you need a replay. I never got it. Wow. So I'm still surviving on that. But the bone sticks out. Mm. Yeah, it's still like kind of, you know. That, you know, it's just weird. You, it's supposed to go down, mine comes out like this. So, that, that race going, and then, you know, there's so many, you, right. but it's so dope. So dope, 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 dope. <laughs> All right, can you talk to us about uh, the Mad Writers? How did that begin, and where are they most known for? Right. The Mad Writers. That was a crew I made in 1978, but before that, Back in 76, I made my other crew, well, more in 75 when I wrote Spark, I had made a crew because I saw a movie. Just like you get influenced, influenced, um, you get influenced by movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, five Fingers of Death. So I made a crew called Five Death Writers. And death was a big word back in the day. Right. People say, oh, death, you don't know nothing. No, no, how you spell it? Oh, D-E-F. No, it was D-E-A-T-H back in the days. To be deaf, you wrote the whole word out. Yeah. Right. So sometimes we write, Spar once in four is death. So you write death. So after I saw that movie, it influenced me to make a crew. But it was just me. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I got to get five friends. And five so I was like, I can teach you this already. Some write, some will do this one. But I was like, yo. So I finally got five guys together. And I made a crew called Five Deaf Writers. Because I love how Five Fingers of Death was such a dope movie. And that leaves you, a, that movie was awesome from that time, you know? That dude was mad awesome. So I made the crew called Five Deaf Writers, and then I made another crew. Because I, after I met some, um, um, Stay High 149, he had something he wrote in the train called Voice of the Ghetto. Mm -hmm. So I thought about, yo, where did I come from? The ghetto. So what can I do? So I made another crew called COG. Children of the ghetto. Children of graffiti. Because by that time, graffiti started getting popular a little right, bit. Right. Because of Noga and, mm -hmm. uh, not before, UGA mm -hmm. and Noga was coming around. And the Upper West Side. And the Noga. So you hear the graffiti word now getting played a lot now. Right. So you use it now. I did the crew. C-O-G. Children of graffiti or children of the ghetto. You know? Because I was a children of the ghetto. 
you know? And the people that roll with me is children from the ghetto, not from no rich place. So that was my crew. And then and, and when I told my brother, I wanted to give him something. So I said, I'm going to make a crew. So when I was in, uh, still, you know, go to school once in a while, hang out everywhere, I was always writing. And they go, damn, you're like this mad guy, yo. You know, they had an old movie called Mad Mad World. Everybody said, you're like mad, mad. I was trying to be tough and do my thing. So, not trying to be tough, because I was tough. I was tough. And you know what? I said, everybody said, you're like a mad writer. You're like mad. And I said, yeah. So in the school, I started writing just mad writers everywhere. And everybody's like, oh, this is that kid. So I made the crew mad writers for my brother, Bane One. You know? Sweet. So Bane One was the vice pres, and I was the pres. Okay. Walk us through um, your process of doing a piece. Walk us through that. Tell me, tell me uh, do you plan it out in detail? Do you do it in a black book? Do you wing it? Do you get help from other people in your crew? It goes like this. When you become a writer, most of the time you go yeah. with one other person unless you go by yourself. Right? Then, the whole thing doesn't matter if you're going to go with a crew or not. It depends on what you're going to do with that crew. If you're going to do a production together. Or you're going to hang with someone. So you're thinking about certain things to be together. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes not all the colors work out to do a, this exact production you want to do. So you just go racking. So the main thing, you get your paint. You get your paint because you already got your sketches if you're already writing. You practice, you got sketches, you got outlines, you got stuff. <coughs> We, we go, we go to Martin Paint, we go to Corvette, even Pathmark had spray paint at one time. A long time ago, man. Right? Well, what time am I talking about? And um, um, those stores, awards too, and then uh, little, little uh, what do you call them stores? Mom and Pop store. My bad. You know, which was one of the easiest places to rack up paint. Because there's only, always just one or two people in there. It wasn't a whole group, you know. Like when you go to Pathmore or you go to Martin Paint, you know, the people are there waiting to see you and watch you. But, you know, we got over all the time, you know. And they had other hardware stores where we had racked up paint, different little small hardware stores. Right. But, you know, my process was, I already have my outlines because I'm on writer. So I'm always going to write. So I got outlines already. Now the... To go about it, now you think about what flavor you want to do. Flavor, you go by your designer markers, which one looks good to get, so you're thinking, yeah, this uh, red, this one, I gotta get this one. But when you go racking, it might not be the same red, but you, you get what you get, and you get it together. The main thing is now getting to the train and doing your piece. So you pack up your bag, either you have a duffel bag, I had one of them old school duffel bags, that swing around your shoulders, like that. Mm -hmm. it looks like it's coming from the gym, or from, you know, or something. You know, it looks more, you know, easy. Sometimes you use bags. Just a regular shopping bag, you know. But the shopping bag, most of the old bags, they didn't have handles on it. You know? They didn't have handles, the paper bag. <coughs> or you had your, a, a backpack. But most of the bags that were used with the bags that are popular now, the one with the two string ones. Right. Yeah, that were one string. Yeah, that simple bag. That simple bag. But how much can you fit in it? Not too much. So if I was going to do a production with my boy and we go paint, they had the army bag. The army bag was popular. Right. You could put mad paint, but then it's heavy. And if you got to climb in and do things, it's hard. So either way, I need that gym bag, the duffel bag, or the army bag. I had my boy help me. The army bag had a long stripe strip, you know, you could have the bag. But, you know, you throw it down, whichever way. Like, you go to three yards, you go to the fence to the school. And I used to go through over there. But as you look at it, even the ghost shot, when I used to go to the ghost shot, that's tricky. You get the entrance was along the river there. And when you get to the site, sometimes it'd be wet, right. muddy. Yeah. You can slide through it. You go, go into the water. Mm. I know a few that went in there, too. <laughs> so, you know, it's, the main thing is about balance, and you got to be ready for whatever. So you something heavy is hard, and most of the time, I don't, I, if I'm getting chased, I got to throw it in the bushes and come back for it later. There's no way you're running with a lot of paint, but you still got your paint. And when I paint, 
I go into the yard, we scope it out if things good the day before, and then we go the day we have to still scope it out because you never know, it changes day by day. Yeah. Then we go in, we get ready. Usually I learned how to paint easy because it was at one time I learned when I got chased, I took all my dumb spray cans out. Mm -hmm. After that, I never did that again because I got chased and I lost all that paint. So what I started doing now was have my, if I have my duffel bag, I put all my cans just facing up in my duffel bag. That way when they kind of come, I pick up and script and run, you know, and then throw it somewhere, you know. But I have, you lay out your paint, you put your colors together right in your bag. I have the color, I start spraying, you know. You take off your top, you change your cap, because they have a cap, a jiffy cap, which Blade and Connor was the first to give me. They gave me my first jiffy cap. See, back in the days, you had caps, but they only came with the can. Right. And some writers would try to learn how to pin it or pull out the white tip that be inside the can. But not until we found out about Niagara spray and our other jiffy cap from the oven spray off and all that. Carmen and Blake gave me my first jiffy cap, my first fat cap. And the day Carmen said, here, take a tag, kid. I said, yeah, I tagged with that can before. I, yo, my name came out like a mush because now I never did use a cap. But I had to show like you know you were there, but no. So when you take a tag with a cap, when you write a tag with a red cap, you can go right here like this with the with the jiffy cap. Now you gotta give space because if you don't give space, everything's gonna be all together. And that's what I did. I went, how did I say? Oh, that cam blew out like it was stronger. Right. That can that fat cap comes out. It doesn't come out. It comes out. So then you so when you go bombing you got your caps. You make sure you have your your jiffy caps, your fat caps. That way you do your filling faster, you know? And then you can go back to the skinny cap for designs, you know? You do design. That's how Billy taught me, that's how Chino taught me, you know? Certain caps for first certain things. But back in the days when I first painted with Smiley, it was like the same cap. You had to fill that whole thing in. It was like scratchy. Yeah. And how much paint you got? You didn't have a thousand cans to be like Oh yeah, that fix this. No, you had the filling in and you got like little missing spots, you know. And then it was but you know, you get it, you do your piece, you get it done. And the sad thing about it, I never had a camera because I was poor. I never really had it. Yeah, some poor kids said they had camera, but I didn't have it. I don't even got baby pictures of me in Puerto Rico. I don't got nothing. Because my mother lost a lot and we were so poor we didn't have it. So it hurts me for me. How about my younger boys? All got them. But me, the last of the one, I don't got it. I don't even got a baby a picture of me. I don't even know how I look like a baby. But that is all good because I got my mom. I rather have my mom than that picture. You know? So all these years I'm enjoying my life with my mom. But that's how we did our thing. We did it and that was it. And someone took a picture, I got it later on. But hey, I was lucky. There was a guy named Can 3. He always went to Esquire and took pictures. He got all the pictures. He got my early pieces with Billy. But that guy is lost in the source. And also, I heard he took someone else's book. Oh, okay. Um, pictures that someone lent it to him, but we don't, we can't find him. And to this day, I've been looking for him. Wow. So, Can Three, where are you? <laughs> you know. Are there any uh, particular colors or brands of spray paint that you prefer? Federal. Uh, Rustolian, huh? <laughs> come on, if it wasn't Federal, be well. Look, come on, those are the After a while, you learn about wow, these colors really come out bright and funky fresh. Right. You know. I mean, all paint was dope, but there was something special about these two brands that came out, the Federal Safety ones and the, and the Wet Look. They kind of gave you, and you know, Krylon was already good. Krylon was already good, you know, because the paint was still good back in the day. Now they changed the formula, now it's watered down. But the, the cans was dope. Rustoleum, Krylon, mm -hmm. that was the two main colors. That was like top of the line, mm -hmm. you know, like getting designer markers. You know, you went from Buffalo markets to designers, it was a whole new world. You know, so, yeah, Westonian, federal colors, the bright, brilliant, fire engine red, all that good color, uh, clover green, uh, Krylon, jungle green, uh, hair, uh, man, this, this, yo, what's that, um, battleship gray, <laughs> oh, there, there's so many, it's, it's hard because when you learn how to write, you don't, you can't memorize any color. Sometimes you're looking just for what color look good on a cap, you know? Then you start learning the names. 
But still, I'm a writer. I'm gonna just see the colors and do it. I'm not. I'm not a professor. I'm not teaching the next. Someone goes like this in the bank. Oh, boy, I just. Yo, what, what color was that? Yeah, was that red? I don't know. That other red. Cause they had a couple of reds, man. That sunset, something. You know. <laughs> sometimes you like at the moment, like you're trying to remember, but when you rack up your paint too, it's different. And your bag is a mix of of Martin paint, of of, of wet looks, of rusto, of everything. Anything you wear. Okay. Sometimes you try to get special color. You know, some people had the opportunities. Right. Some people didn't. You will look down. Once you go in the store and you look the way you did, you had like a shadow on you. Yeah. You had a shadow on you, yeah. A shadow. But there were some other special people that could go in like, hey. Yeah. People want to say no, but that's a reality. How many times I went in there with my boys? And my boys are both black and Spanish. So we both rock, you know. So a lot of black guys that hang that way, other guys that hang out, we all always look down. You know, I went with a white kid. Hey, I know it's a little different, and especially in the neighborhood. So they will rack up for me. As a lookout, because we're boys. So if we go to Westchester, we started creeping into Westchester. My white boy friends were going out with the decoy. Because who's they going to look at? That's right. Oh, look at this. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah, can I help you? I'm like, oh, I need us. I was looking for some, what's a good paint for, you know, paint clubhouse on my bike. I mean, you know, but then I had to think about a way, how to keep them away. So I have to say, I'm looking for some school. I'm looking for a school because I want to make a skateboard or, you know, back in the days we had the wood and the, and the crate on top. And you need the screws to screw, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, just take the skate apart. Shh, put one on the front, one on the back. Yeah, yeah. So I used to be like looking for screws. So I have to go to that department or the area away from the spray paint. So they go in there, they rack up all the paint. I'm looking for the screw. <laughs> you know, I'm like, after I get a box of that, we're walking to it. No, no, it's too much. <laughs> I walk out. Some guys are going already. So that was a good thing. I had good white friends. So that was good people. They look out for you, man. <laughs> really? Really look. Oh man, really, really can't. Them guys, they don't look at them guys, man. You go to Westchester, you go up, up, uh, White Plains. Mm -hmm. You go up White Plains, back in the day, it was all white. People don't think about that. Yeah, some black people there, but that was like a good place. Everything that went past 180 was a good place. <laughs> yeah. You had, you had Baychester where I lived for two years in Eden Wall Projects. Right. You know? And, uh, they had certain rides that I met when I was going up there, too. But what I'm trying to say, they have a bounce. Baychester, that was grimy. The Valley, you know, they had certain places, but it was like most of it was good up there. The good, even the projects were up there. Were yeah, up town. Good. Yep, that was a little different, you know, yeah. than where we grew up at. So, you know, we had Lambert, we had Lambert, yeah. you know, we had the, we had all the eight hundred buildings. We, had, you know, we had maids. Yeah, yo, I wouldn't change anything where I grew up because anyone could talk about their history. But where we're from, that whole West Farm area, we had legends there. Mm -hmm. That was legendary. Yeah. My cousin Chiyama won the first to put the Cheech Wizard on the train. Sweet. The first to do a Star Wars train. Come on. <laughs> and where they come from? West Farm. Where these crews come from? West Farm. But TFP, you know, we had more houses. More houses is a good place. My boy Shea. That's yeah. how I got down with them. Good case. I got down with TFP. That was a very famous crew. Yeah. And it wasn't easy to get there. But then when you be friend a good person, they see your style and see who you're rolling with, they give you shake with my boy, introduce me to Case, and it became love, you know? Sweet. Sometimes it helps you. And but but you gotta after that introduction, you is your next step to prove to them who you are. Just because someone gives you a pass, now who are you? Just a side bird? No. Mm -hmm. I went painting with Case a couple of times. But to paint, really to paint with Case one time? He got me upset. Because Case is the type that likes to take over. And I went with him and said, Yo, yeah, you're getting good, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, we'll go. We're going to go paint an Esplanade, right? He wants to do my piece. We have an argument. I said, No, you said I'm good. I want to do my own shit. No, no, not on this car. We never painted together. I painted here, he painted there. Because some people, Case is a dope writer, he was good, but 
there's somebody that feels like they need to have their whole style on the train. Right. Even their own outline. They don't want to, you know, it's very hard with certain people. And Case was like that. He was my boy. He was good. But, he, you know, he, he get crazy. He could get crazy. And he want to do everything. And you're like, what am I here for? Right. I learned how to be a writer. I'm a writer. I do my own shit. Even when I went with Billy, Billy's like, let's go. And you got to prove to your cousin Chino. And then when you go to Chino, you got to prove. Now do your own life. That's the hardest part. Okay, you feel all the color. Blah, blah, blah. Now, how do you bring out that letter? That's right. How? And that's when people don't understand. They're like, oh, yeah, the dish is easy. It could be easy. But it's also mentally the people around you looking at you like, let's go. And you're like, and you're short. You have to stand on the third rail or you got to stretch your ass up. Like I was a short kid. So I got to loop my shit over and get it in there. And yo, know, one thing that helped me, lucky, I was kind of like already born to be neat. I'm kind of neat. From doing tattooing, I was already born to be neat. So when I took that camera, so I painted, of course it drips on everybody. But you learn to control quick. And I learned kind of faster than other people. So when I did my piece, I only had one or two drips in mm-hmm. my first piece. And that was, the, you know, Tina was like, oh. That's good. Mm-hmm. And you filled in that little dining it, you know? When I did the spa piece, because you got like little, ed, you know, the letters and you got to fill it in. Those are where you spray too much and it sprays all out. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, where are we going now? Okay, uh, all right, let's move along. Um, tell us about your collaborations with Mad Hatton. First, I got to tell you about Mad Writers. My brother, I was depressed. I did it for my brother because you look out here for your family. You got him to learn how to write. You make him the vice pres, and he has to step up. He starts hanging out with Billy and Smiley and everybody. I introduce him to him. He started rocking. The crew was about... Every other crew that came before us, they put style and they keep the foundation of graffiti alive. Whether bombing insides or outside. My crew wasn't about just style. It was about being a good writer, but it was about getting up. And about getting up is about keeping the culture of graffiti alive. So if you got the guys that are doing burners every week, if it wasn't without other writers like our crew mm-hmm. and other crew, how could it, that's how we help each other. While we're doing something coming to this show to get us busted, they're not going over there where they could do a nice production. Right. It's like that sometimes. I think people overlook even the smallest writers that just wrote for like a year. Because everybody that put, put their effort to be a writer, that helped the culture grow. So it don't matter if you wrote one year or you wrote 20 years. If you were a writer, you wrote at the time. You wrote to keep the culture alive that we're all trying to keep alive. And I hate when people go, oh, you only wrote two something like that. Oh, you only wrote two years. Oh, you only did. I hate that because it's not about that. Mm-hmm. It's about a revolution we're doing. So if we're all doing it, you may be doing tags on the wall, tags in the inside, doors on the outside, burn is here, time tomorrow. We're all doing it to keep the coach alive. This shit blows up. Everybody's doing it. The ones that are doing the thing is this. We're all in the same boat. We're trying to keep your feet alive. It ain't all about now. Oh, I was famous. Took all my car. Yeah, but other dudes were risking their life to keep the graffiti alive too. That's right. Not just the one that's doing pretty shit. Right. You know. So that's why I don't like. But then my crew was about that, keeping the foundation alive of all the crews I was in before, and to follow up from my cousin crew, because he was mad transit artist. So I'm glad to keep something with mad in it. Mad transit artists, mad tanger, mad writers. We were mad. Mad writers? Yep. Um, 1978. That was a good year, too. Best one, 49 us, everybody. Oh, yeah, what was it? Oh, Manhattan? Okay. Okay, well, characters are a significant part of your pieces. And how do you incorporate them into your artwork? Mm -hmm. So... Since I'm a kid, since I'm a kid, I've been drawing, you know, drawing character, drawing everything. And when I got into graffiti, that was, you know, I got into it because it's all about the letters. Right. So I got into it, but by seventy, by the end of seventy five, seventy six, I saw how many people were doing more and more characters, and 
I wanted to get a name to incorporate. That's why I changed my name from Spark 174 to Bond 76. Now I had an O. That O, I could do anything with it. And you can still... Right in the middle. Yep. Still tell my name. So sometimes I'll do an explosion. I did an explosion before. I did a mug before, like a B-boy mug, like a character mug. And that's the other thing I want to give props to my cousin, Chino Model. Okay. A lot of people want to say they started this writer <laughs> in 1980 or this one. But way before that, Chino Marlo was a style character master. He already had mad style with characters. My cousin Chino Marlo had flavor. He was a dope artist and he was already getting into the hood being joint characters. He looked like smoking a joint with a dope doobie hat, a dope. You know, funky old school straw hat, funky stuff. Yeah. You know, we had the Applejack hats. I knew to wear. You know, these hats are famous back in there. If you, if they really know about, it, they know. But the people that don't know, they say, "Oh, that's a stupid name." But that hat, Applejack hat, was a famous hat back in the days. If you had an Applejack hat, you were dope. That, the Kango. Yeah. Right. You know. So my cousin would start incorporating that in the characters. Instead of doing basic hat, he started doing that. Then he started putting the ski goggles on. His big glasses. And when I first saw that in his house, I said, whoa, man. And then what he did, what he did, the next step, what he did is he didn't take this goggles and just paint it one color. He started putting blends in there. I'm like, oh, man. And I started doing my characters off of him. And then getting better, I started incorporating my style characters. Mm -hmm. So when I got the name with the O, I, wanted, I started doing my characters for my O. Doing a side mug, seeing like Phase Do and everybody. And uh, where and everybody do and to my style style profile. Yeah, I had an afro too, and then I had a, I wore hats too. So you make the side profile with the hat, or or with the afro, and it was dope, you know. And I do, you know, I started doing characters. I started getting characters from mad comic books. Yeah, that, that was a big influence. A lot of people don't want to say it, mm -hmm. but Cracker, Mad Magazine. Uh, my cousin was the first to find that uh, uh, Baudet. Baudet is a Cheech Wizard. Mm -hmm. So they, they blew it up, you know, with that comic book, Underground Comics, when it led me to see Art Crump. Uh, this other Underground Comic artist, Crump, keep on trucking characters. You start seeing things, and then you're like, oh, I can start doing this. So that's how you learn how to build your characters and your style. And that's by seeing these old comic books, man. He had superheroes too. Right. But for all, oh, yeah, I enjoyed the whole character. I didn't enjoy the whole character, but some people did do like Superman S's, you know? The Superman S, yeah. that or something, or some syllable from a, a superhero. But, you know, it was mostly like mad comics, the characters, the funky faces, the weeded out characters at the time. Yeah. Everything was weeded. It was about weed back in the 70s. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. Every character had a joint. They had all kinds of underground comics with these guys from all crumb to some other dude. Mad comic. Yo, it was just good time. So I built my characters. And I, I did it. I did characters here and there on the train. But the main thing was I didn't want to lose what graffiti was about. And that was to build your style of letters. It was like anything else in the world. The alphabet is something that you have to build on. You have to learn how to print your name. You got to learn how to do these shapes. It could be the same way. How far can you take this letter? How far can you take this B, this M, this O? How far? How many times can you take this B and show me 20 Bs on a paper? So that was a mission. Now you're like, oh, man. Then you learn how to connect your letters. First, everything was separate. Now you're going to learn how to put the B to the M. Yeah, yeah. This got to be in. How to put a crown or a halo or draw something, you know. And it became dope. It was, hey, everybody goes like this. Oh, bum, you're good. You went to art school. <coughs> B, I was already writing before I went to art school. So what are you telling me? What Matter of fact, art school should be happy that I was dope already before I got in there. But they didn't respect my skills. So that's why I'm back then. And that guy had to walk around with a black eye. And that's life, you know? <laughs> I got kicked out, but I still made something in my life. <laughs> With <you> the <laughs> For sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, talk to us about your mentors in graffiti and their impact on your art. Man, if there was no Smiley 149, no staff, 
AJ one sixty one. Look, Steph, I heard about so much from Billy one sixty seven. Mm-hmm. So Billy said, "Yo, you're ready. You're ready to meet Steph." And he said, seventy six. We go to Steph's block. Steph, there's no way to be found. Billy's rocking with this crew that's an all black, dope, famous crew from the Third Avenue L and the Twenty Five. This guy Steph was the first guy to do a character on the train. You know, these guys were legendary, the Ebony Dukes. Mm-hmm. That's right. But you got a white boy named Billy, nasty style master, in his own right, that got down with them. How could that be possible? But it was about graffiti, it was not about colors, but style. Mm-hmm. And Steph recognized that. So Billy's rocking, and Billy's like, yo, you're getting good. Time to go meet. So we go and see Steph, he's not there. We go back to the boy club, who we bump into? AJ. I show AJ my notebook. Hey, this place up over here. Yeah, gonna get down with Ted because I got a pass from Billy. But you gotta put it up and get up and recognize. And then, right. to this day, that AJ recognized. He's my boy, and it was a blessing. I got to talk to him recently. And he, that's the man. Him, I always wanted to meet Steph, but never met him. But when me and Steph met, when he came back around, it was like brotherhood from the beginning. You know, and we, wow. his family. So. There's dumb guys, Billy, Butch, without his style, I had to watch his style too. People don't understand. You gotta give props where the props is due. So when you have, you have many graffiti, but when you got a B in your name, you kind of look forward to see how other B and how they form their oh, letters. Yeah. Now I got Billy already, but you gotta keep watching. You gotta watch over the years, all the letters of the train. But when you get a name, I had the S, so Smiley influenced me more with the S's, you know? You know, rough. rough didn't write rough yet. He was writing Rip 1, R-I-B. You know, so his B's, I would see. But B, like, you know, my cousin also learned from Butch and other people too, you know? But everybody had their style, and we had dope style. So, I would have to say it's like, uh, Smiley, it has to be Smiley, it has to be uh, AJ. Yeah, he did some dope shit, motivated me. He gave me influence, like, even give me an opportunity to get down with Ted Incorporated. So when someone gives you that love, you got to take it to the next step. You can't be toyed after that. You right. got to be like, yo, I got to put in 100%. Represent. And Billy, you know, mm-hmm. the guys I, I really acted, you know, acted with, be with. So it was Dumb and uh, Chino and Billy. Was, those are my main mentors. Yeah. That's from the train by seeing it. Butch, Butch, um, uh, 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 Marco for hairstyle. And he told me hairstyle, like, even to get better. And, you know? And super cool just to be like, yo, you got to go out and do it. You can't be scared. Be like, but look at you, Pete. Hey, anyone be scared of you? He said, me. You, but you got a van. You small. You get through these fences. You got crying. Like, he was a big dude, yo. So, you know, if they made a little friends, he can't go through it. He's a big dude. He's a big dude, yo. I wish one day he'd come back. And I, like, I talk to him. He don't want to come around. Because sometimes, you know, the position you make in your life as a black and Hispanic person in this life, there's always someone creeping around the corner to put you down for any little shit. Yes, sir. So once they saw a picture of you with certain people, I'd be like, that guy looks like he's drinking liquor, he's smoking, that guy looks like he's on crack, he's a drug dealer. That's when they'd be like, oh, this guy may be doing this shit too. Mm-hmm. So then I give respect to them people because they got to stay away because they got to live their life. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to switch gears on you. Mm-hmm. How did you become a member of Zulu Nation? Mm-hmm. Tell us that backstory. Well, yeah, it's all the fluence with being around Cisco Kid and all them guys. But with with them, the first time I met Bam was I was uh I was in the Savage School, and they told me about Bronxville. So I went from seventy, I'm from one seventy fourth. They have a bridge that goes over to Bronxville Project. So I met Bam through graffiti first. He used to write Bam one seventeen. And after that, Bam bought it. He used to write graffiti. He used to write Bam one seventeen. So I met him on the bridge. I didn't have colors. He, he didn't have colors. And we met. And he's taking a tag. He's taking a tag. And I'm taking a tag. We're taking a tag on the bridge. And we meet. And we become friends. You know? The funny thing about that, two days or three days later, I'm riding my bike to Bronx River. I see him with a group of dudes. They got the Sabbath skull. I mean, they got the black space colors. And I'm walking on my vest on my bike. Sabbath skull. I'm like, oh, this that same guy. I said, motherfuckers. I started throwing bottles at them. 
And they started throwing shit at me, and they started coming at me. So I had to get back on my bike and ride my bike away. They were throwing, like, rocks and other stuff, and I had to get away. But I threw bottles at the first, because I was like, I thought he was my friend. But, you know, that's someone you just met. I thought he was just a rock. It was, it was weird. Yeah. I just wrote my gang name on the bridge, but I didn't put no ass down. It was, it was just weird, but then over the years, I wound up going to Bronx River for their first party, one of their first parties back in the days. It was 76, 70, yeah, I think 76, 75. And I went there, and I see the same dude there, and his band talking. How about he, he's trying to like put together something? And uh, we became friends with him and other people I knew in the projects there at Bronx River Prison. Projects that had friends there. We became friends and they started making a group called Zulu Nation. But before Zulu Nation, I was down with a group called Zulu Kings. They were B boys from Bronxdale Project. Right. That's where I used to hang out. So to get his first step, Van Barden, I kind of saw him also in, in uh, Bronxdale Project because his foundation of getting to be a DJ came from there, not from Bronx River. Right. By watching Disco King Mario, he was the one that was doing the parties. In the mid seventies, he was the one that joined the parties in the um, in the no, early seventies to mid. But uh, um, he was a he was a black spade. He was the black spade DJ. So them guys formed a crew called the Zulu Kings for dancers with Charlie Rock and all these guys. So they formed a beat boy club. I met with them, and by going to that school party, that's at PS uh, IS one twenty three, right off the Brooklyn. You know. Uh, so they, they had a schoolyard, they used to do parties there. So I joined up with them, became friends. We used to do, uh, we had them red wagons back in the days, mm -hmm. the little red wagon. We'd fill it up with records or, or speakers and drag it from the project to the school. So it was like a few blocks away. But you can see the project, you can see the school from each other away. And we go over there to uh, IS-123 and set up the schoolyard. And all the DJ would be there. And one of the famous DJs that was down with them was DJ Tex. He was an early DJ, which was Puerto Rican, but he was black skin. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. When did you become a savage skull? Tell us about that story. Yeah, that was the end of the 60s, yeah. That was, that was good times, man. When I joined with them, they became baby skull, uh, young skull, and, you know, moved on through the ranks through my cousin. You know, C2, he was already down with them. And by joining that, it's because, you know, I had to find a way, because I, I kind of lost focus in life after, you know. Horrible incident in my life happened in my family, so it made me look for a different. I had to look for a different way because I need to get this anger out that I had. Yeah. And I found it in them that they understood where I was coming from, and yeah, just move on through the ranks with that. Okay. And it, it was good and bad times too because you had to do some bad stuff. You know, you had everybody had to look out for each other. You know, and, to, and not only that to get down and be tough, you had to go through the patchy line, and that was no joke. Not only that, one time we were, we were, where was it, near um, Fort Apache area near Simpson Street? No, yeah, I think where well, I was there. But they told me, you see that dude? It was a black dude leaning on a car. And they said, you got to go up to him and tell him what time it is. And you got to punch him in the face. I said, what? No, nah, no. Nah. And they're like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. We'll be right here in the corner. Just run back here. So I went to the guy. And I said, yo, what time you got? He said, what? Well, you want to know? I said, I just want to know what time. So, you know, everybody had watches. So when you go down, <laughs> so he went to get his watch up. I was like, right off a kind of crack. And that guy ain't going nowhere. He's like, hell yeah, but he ain't going nowhere. And he went, what motherfucker? So I ran. And I'm fast. I'm running. And the corner's coming up. I'm getting to the corner, right? Hollywood. Everybody see a hippie. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I get to the corner. I slow down. Yeah. No one's here, yo. And this black dude was right there. And I'm like, I had to pick up speed again and get away. I'm like, why you guys left me? Hey, he's just chesting. I'm like, nah, that guy got caught. That guy would have killed me. And all I had to do was talking about, I'm going to stab you. I was booking, yo. So I got away. But, you know, all right. different times. And then also when we had uh, rumbles and stuff, a lot of us younger guys, baby and young scouts, we had to put the guns in the army bag. So, if we get busted, we don't go to jail because we're underage. So, that's why they kind of made the younger chapters later on. Right. You know, the, the baby skulls and the young skulls because 
They can pass us the weapon, the shotgun, the zip gun, that thing. We can't get arrested. They can't arrest a kid that's 10, 11 years old. Right. They can't. They can't. So that was like, help, it helped the game. It helped, you know, for me. But me and Hippie was crazy. Hippie was my boy. Cool, cool. Yeah. Now, DJ, what drew you to become a DJ? And do you still spin? Yeah, yeah. Still spinning, still game, doing my thing. And uh, I had to slow down for a while. The year I got the... T- Tendon, tendonitis? Right, tendonitis. Yeah, that's, that's from years of having a headphone on and being in clubs. And, you know, we had these gyms. We were rocking the loudspeakers in these small, like, community center rooms. You know, Lambert Center, all these, blasting the music. You're going deaf, but you're not feeling it. And when you get older, you start wondering why you get this ring in here. You still DJ because when you DJ, you got to have one headphone or two. But when you have two, it still has to be louder than the music you're playing. That way you know you can yeah. hear the next song. So this should start loud in your ear. Then after years, I started only using one side for DJ. And then this one got affected. But I slowed down over there and I came back again. But I still DJ, you know. And wow. getting into it was like through my mentors. Same thing. Phase two, everybody. Seeing DJ Cool Herc, seeing Disco King Mario, DJ Tech, being friends with DST from Eden More Projects. Meeting with a breakout and everybody. Baron was my boy. We, you know, you meet good people and you got proof. That, you know, the whole thing about Baron Day, people don't understand, right? The right boy. You can meet people. But Baron Day was a, a very, you got to, like, okay, this guy, he can roll with me. This guy, younger. You got to show that you also got heart. You got to have heart and you got to be dedicated. You got to show that. Not just by getting down, not never showing up again. You got to be consistent. So I would go to these blocks. My whole mission in my young life was going block to block, block to block. I go here. I go to Faye's house. Cowboy was my man in the building. He lived in the same project, Bar's project. Faze, uh, Flash would be up that way. Cowboy. So we all hang out at 63 Park, 123 Park, 23 Park. There's so many parks to name, man, mm-hmm. that everything was happening at, man. You know, so... Learning from these guys, I got motivated. And then Van Barter taking, you know, like showing me and uh, Disco Key Man was saying, hey, you ready to get on the turntable? So it was good. And then getting more and more learning from Jumba. Jumba. DJ Jumba. You know, with Hollywood. You know? And I, you know, you know, I don't know. Well, Jumba had a business. He, since I was young, I could. I got down with the business a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, help bring some money to me. Got it. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It so, is what it is, Papa. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, he, he, but he, he was uh, my mentor too for DJing and uh, other life showing me, like, you can make money and, um, he always had my back. Hollywood was good with me, but we always had falling out late. We live here and there a little bit because about his mature audience thing. And what we were doing, he was looking down on what the Bronx was doing. They from Harlem. Mm-hmm. And he wants to be a big part of it. I get him mad love. He's my boy. But, you know, it's really hip-hop that blew you up, bro. Okay. Hip-hop is what we were doing in the Bronx. What you were doing with the two turntables and the record. We were playing. They could say all they want to disco DJ. Yeah, but I was playing this. But it was how we were playing it. It was how we were playing and what we were doing. Cool Herc? Whoa, Cool Herc's not even a good DJ. D, you can talk all you want, but do you have the idea he had? The merry go around. Do you take that same break and play it over and over for these B boys and dancers to be like, oh, oh, this party ain't never gonna end. If this, he got it popping in the, yep. the hype part, the break part. Pop, 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 dropping needles, click, click. Click, click. So it never ran out. So everybody, you know, once that slow pour cup, people be like, ooh, time to chill. Ain't nothing yeah. happening. And then when it really gets slow, you just want to dance with a girl. Right. But then you got guys that there to, you know, dance, b-boy hood. They like get hyper off the break of James Brown, Jimmy Cashel, all the bands, you know, like they yeah. got the break. So, you know, that's what we did. And then they say, they say, disco came in. He was a disco. Oh, yeah, just go his name. He. Now, the people that say that shit from hip hop, they say it now, say, everybody had disco in their names in some way or another. So, I don't care if you say, oh, disco was whack. B, they had disco B. They had disco disc. They had so many, I was down with a crew in Zulu Kings, a 
Zulu Nation called Soundmaster Disco. And that was a hip hop group. So why do some hip hop nowadays say, oh, disco, we had nothing to do with it? Come on, dude. Yeah, we used the word. MCs had their names, the name disco in their word. Come on, man. Right, right. You know, so, you know, just because disco came out and had that, he played the funk. He was on the funk. The only difference I have between them two is that they go, cool her. But we got to give love to Disco Kimaria because he was Black Spade DJ. And not only that, he didn't come from nowhere. He was from the Bronx, born and raised and already playing in the park for the Black Spades. So who, what can they say? I just give both of these guys love. Just both of them. Who hurt? And Disco came in. One without the other ain't gonna work out. Because Kuha came here. This guy was already here. Right. Jamming. Rocking. With who? With one of the biggest gangs in New York. The Black Spade. He was the DJ for them. So, and then the Black Spades had a dance. Wow. The Spade dance. So a lot of things came from that. That was hip hop already. So you can't just say, if it wasn't for this one or that one. I just gotta say, how to give him love. Mario a little ahead before him. But don't, you know, like mm -hmm. don't don't erase that guy, man. Because without him, there'd be no Van Bard. Because Van Bard first got his set going on with him, going to 123 Park. And DJ, uh, Jazzy Jeff, Jay, they all got their start with him. So why why keep saying they ain't nobody? But now we go to Van Bard. He made Zulu Nation from back in the days, grew over the years. I was down with him. I talk shit about Van Bart. Never saw him doing none of that. He never came down to me. You know, maybe he knew who would have messed with, but I just feel like this. No matter what Bam did, he wrong for doing any of that. But I gotta say that. He always treated me like a brother from day one since I was a kid. Never disrespect me. Taught me about more about DJing too. And not only that, if it wasn't for Bam that didn't think about money, he kept it in the parks more than any other DJ to keep the foundation for any kid that could walk by and be like, I'm going to stop robbing. I want to, let me see what's this all about. Let me get in. I want to be a DJ. Oh, what's some guys on the floor? B-boys? I want to learn that. A graffiti jacket, a t-shirt. Oh, what are you? What do you do? I'm a writer. Oh, maybe I'll be a writer. Instead of a stick-up kid only on one of the Instead of robbing or hurting people, you know? Like that, that mother, I give him 100% for that. He's the one that continue and continue to get free stuff. And it's sad what's going on with him all these years now. Yeah. But he is still a big part. And when they talk shit about like Bam and Zulu Nation, they can't do that. He might be the president, the founder, whatever, but all the Zulu Nation is still doing good for community around the world. We you can't look at him and say, oh, these then we don't want nothing to do with these guys. That's not bad to say. Because a lot of kids got their lives saved by being in Zulu Nation to this day. So, uh, wake up, world. You know? That's like saying the President Trump did something. Anybody that worked in his office was an asshole. Right? Yeah. So there's some people that got to work there and just do what he got to do. He's like, I'm against this, but hey, you got to work for your family or you quit your job. What are you going to do? Right? And sometimes you... You gotta do what you gotta do, yeah, but you gotta do. Sure. it's just sad when people don't recognize we recognize people, man. Right? You know? Breaking. Talk, yeah. talk to us about the breaking rocking cruise you were with. Yeah, rocking. It was outlaw rocking first with the Savage Skulls, with Hollywood teaching me, and rolling with Hippie and everybody, and just going to other clubhouse and dancing against each other, and a good time rocking. And then it became freestyle rocking. So I joined with the both and tried to combine the two styles I learned from the famous freestyle dancer named Rubber Band, you know, from Puerto Rico. And he used to live on the other side. His father was a, a pastor, you know. But he was out there. He got killed early on, so he lost that legend. And uh, um, the rocking continued, which became eventually just a move. When I got into B-Point, there was another move going on that I learned from Cisco called Kid, and uh, it was called Top Rocking. It was a move just, everybody used to do these top moves, like, you know? It was almost like outlaw rocking, but a little softer, just with one basic move, two step, with a hand swinging to get you down, get you ready to go down. 
But before that, Top Rock was a dance all by itself, so we had different styles, Top Rock. You know, that was again, that was way different than Outlaw Rock. Right. Top Rock was just solo you before anything. But then it became, Top Rock became the point where you did the two step before you get down to the B boy steps and to your footwork. And the first palm move, when they talk about palm moves, they talk about back spin, head spin, but in B boy, going on, the first palm, palm move was the footwork. So once you got down on the ground, start doing footwork, that was a whole different work of power, trying to get this rotation going on. And in B boy, I helped kind of help formulate it in a way through my mentors, what I learned from them, and also, I'm one of the first people that reversed it. Because at the time, everybody was going in one circle, going putting their footwork like this. And then one day, I was doing some footwork, and I got caught, stuck in my footwork, I went back the other way. And Cisco said, no, yo, that's good, clockwise. I don't know. I'm just going, I'm, you know, going this way. Everybody going this way. And then I got stuck and I went this way and then I went back. And I, he said, do it again. And I started doing my footwork one way and learning how to do it the other way around. So, and then that's when it became rotation and movement. And it, it helped you get more flavor to your footwork. And not only that, uh, in the beginning, uh, B-point was all, everybody had their unique style. So you learn some stuff. That's important. Yeah. For, that's important. You uh, good? Yeah. So then, so B boy, learning from these guys. At the time back in there, it was freestyle, so everybody get down and go. There was no step. But then the Puerto Rican part started adding their flavors after '76 and started formulating crews. Well, the first Puerto Rican all B boy crew from 1975 is the Bronx Boys. That was a crew I joined while I was in the Zulu Kings. Bronx Boys was a graffiti crew in 1974 from Bat, uh, Best 149, a younger brother. He used to write Cash. He made a crew called TVB. We had my other boy from the neighborhood called Shark. He wrote Shark. He used to hit the buses a lot. So they made the crew called TVB, and it stood for the Bronx Boys. And in 75, Bats joined up with them. Bats was down with them, and I was down with them. And Bats and then T, uh, Bats joined. He said, I like, want to formulate the crew into more like a B-boy crew because B-boy is getting more popular. So that became the first more, the first Latino or hip-hop B-boy crew, everything to me. Because it became a rocking crew, and we started bringing our flavor more into the dance that came from the blacks. And it started adding more and more flavor hours from, right. from you know, disco, I mean, um, salsa moves, salsa move, rocking. It's like, I gotta, I gotta demonstrate, but it's using some of the moves in salsa. That's another salsa. video. Yeah, like doing top rocking and then going down to the ground, adding some flavor footwork more with a salsa twist when you're on the ground. And uh, yeah, before we can do it, started making more moves and innovating the dance even more. Until like maybe 78, 77, we formulated a move called a six step. For my boy Shorty and them. But there's many people that try to formulate it. But we all work together doing it. So these guys from Burnside Avenue, Shorty Rock and uh, uh, Spy, he was a man with a thousand moves. He was one of the most popular B-boys that had our flavor too, mm. of the Puerto Rican. And they formulated like a figure of a way to do B-boy steps. So it was a six step they counted. And that became famous for the world to know. Mm. Wow. And those six steps was your, was your style. Now you had a, like a regular routine, like when you go dance salsa, you had your you gotta go this way, you know. Before it was just everywhere, and now it's like you can pinpoint it now. And it's kind of show you about the crazy commander crew formulated that. They from the West Bronx, you know. Sweet. So, yeah, and that was good. That was the foundation, and you got six step. But when you stop at the fifth, we learned the fifth is when you started doing new power moves. That's going into a backspin, spinning on your back. So. You can't go to the full six. You go to the five, that brought you into a move. Like you could, after that step, you could whip yourself to get on your back, your side. The early palm moves were footwork, and then came ass, ass spinning, side spinning on the side of your body. And then uh, when you do the ass spin, you sometimes lean back and get on back. And then the back, back uh, move, back spin formulated. You do an ass spin, and then you lean on your back, 
You still spin a little bit. You're like, oh, I can spin now. Spin hard on my ass, then throw myself on my back. I'm still spinning. So it became popular, the back spin. So you know, everybody's formulating and D-Boy kept going, you know? And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's just that I didn't like it. Like nowadays, a lot of other black B-Boys that came from Cool Herd Party saying, they started all this. But they know, they, they, they also saying Puerto Ricans were never involved. And the, the sad part about that, they, they saying that because they lost all this time away and they want to come in and be angry that a lot of Puerto Ricans are like one of the number one B-Boys in the world. You know, half of them helped formulate it. But why you get angry? Like you just say the truth. But a lot of them, I, don't know. I even know some of them when I met in Kuhu Party to this, to this day when I see them. They go, and I do a move with them. I'm in Katona Park, and we meet them, and I'm dancing with them. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I started. I was the first one. I said, B, look in my eyes, man. You started this? I never saw you do that. Oh, boom. Oh, yeah, I, I started. Then they go, they, they know who they're talking to. Because I, I, it's not about who's right or wrong. It's about just keeping it real. Keep it real. Keep, these brothers are your brothers, man. Yeah, we got thrown in together with you. You were there before us. But well, it's not our fault. It's like anywhere in the world when someone got got to run from war and go to a new country or something. We, okay, you got to learn your language. You got to learn your language and, and, and learn how to adapt to our environment. But don't, but, but you pushing us out, we're never going to grow. That's why the gang got formulated. That's why you had Puerto Rican gang blew up in one night. There was mad Puerto Rican gangs. So the Puerto Rican gang had to be there to protect themselves and their hood and their people. But then the blacks recognized and some got along and got together. And the people like Bam that helped stop. You know, first that first meeting is in one seventy four from Black Benji, he passed away from a gang war. Mm -hmm. That kinda helped, but it didn't help because the gang was still going, still violence was going on. It was not until Bam helped more. And then Barbara had more to put people together of all races and all. That's why my saying is, I don't see color, I see skills. So if I meet you, Sweet. it's about what you got to bring to this game with me. Right? They have got, oh, you're black, I can't fuck it. Oh, you what? Uh, mess, uh, oh. No, it's about, yo, B, we can flow. And that me, I'm one of the first B-boys that travel. One of the first to be going around. And you know what? A lot of people don't say nothing about that. Because now people travel in the 2000s. Oh, B, I'm free, yo, damn, what my stuff? But yo, go way, way back and talk to these guys. They tell you Bonfire was here already. I was in Germany. I was in Switzerland. I was in France. I was in Japan. I went to Korea already. I went here. No one was taking me. I was going there for the love and trying to bring something. Now they give me the love and bring me back all the time. So it's not about sometimes you have to go and help a culture grow. Tell us about your, your most uh, memorable b-boy tour. Yeah. I think, no, but when the B-Boy tours came a little later on with the Star Wars and all that, so I took advantage of all that when I went to Japan back in there, you know? I was in 83, so took advantage of going through there and also situated myself to stay in London. When I went to London, I stayed in London for a year. You know, I tried to stay growing there. The other B-Boys would go there and all these guys in the early days with the Wolverham B-Boys, um, Ducky, he girl bubbles, she got down with uh they got down with Zulu Nation. So Zulu Nation was growing and growing all around Europe. You know? That's kinda of where the, one of the first places uh Zulu went to was Europe. Going to Paris and uh London. All of them ever start growing with Zulu Nation with the influence of us from the Bronx. Not from no Brooklyn, not from the Zulu Nation which first Bronx and spread throughout New York City. You know, okay. they spread because you had Zulu in Brooklyn, you had Zulu in the, But, you know, Zulu was not always like that, too. We had like beef and uh, disrespect from other crews like the Ball Busters uptown, and also a lot of Brooklyn cats that like Zulu. The, always Brooklyn and Bronx always had a beef. Even though I had some good connection with them, I remember one time I was taking the train, it was like 1980, from Brooklyn. I'm coming back from Brooklyn. I was still in Brooklyn. I was coming back. I had my Zulu uh, first wooden beads and my card. And uh, these guys just jumped me. These three black guys. And I had to fight them. And if it wasn't for at that time that happened, I probably put me in worse condition. But I had to fight. They like, first they go, oh, peace or key. Like, you know, like the same we say in Zulu. 
And like, yo, I have like a key piece. That's how you know each other. Okay, he's saying he's Zulu, I'm Zulu, so we're brothers. So he was bullshit. So he went and put, grabbed my beads to rip. And he, they tried to jump me. Oh, fuck Zulu. And it was a whole beat. And lucky I survived because the two guys came on the train that day. And I was going back to the park. They said, what the fuck on? And they ran out. They ran out. And it, but after one, one, st- one stop of fighting. So I got busted up a little. I gave back a little. And it could have been worse, I think. Huh? You know, they can't rob me or even want to maybe stab me afterwards. Because a lot of stuff was happening at that time, too. You know, but they had the Decepticons. Mm-hmm. Them guys were rolling on the train. And then they had another group on the three line called the Cigar Mob. These are like black uh, militants. If you, was, yo, if you was not black, they were having you. You know, I had an incident. I was with Dez and Scheme that day. We were on the train. It was like six of us. It was like sixes up. They came in the train like 20, 25 deep. Wow. And my boy Averick, Averick, the original Averick, not the other kid from Brooklyn. Averick from the three line. He's Puerto Rican and big. They stepped to him first. First, Dez protected me. Yo, rest in peace. Dez, love you, my brother. We go way back, me and Dez. The thing with him, the thing with him, the cigar, the, the cigar mob came on the train, and when they came at us, um, Dez knew two of them. And that's when Dez said, yo, yo, they looked at me, because I was a, one of the lightest ones. And they wanted to get at me. And I was like, yo, like, yo. So I just continue on. I continue on. And uh, Dez protected me and said, no, you're not touching him. If it wasn't, he, they were going to rain on me. They beat me down. So Dez put his hand on my said, yo, you're not touching him. So we were corner. We were corner in the, um, where the door to the next room. We got corner there with one guy blocking the door that was strapped. And he said, no one's going nowhere. We had to stay on the train line. So while that train ride was going on, we um they went to Avery. Avery was a big quarter man. So he leaning on the door, and one guy came and like, yo, what's up? What's up? You know. And he was like, Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. So they were looking to beat someone up. And they picked him, but yo, he fought all of them. The first guy, I don't know who it was, the leader or something, he did one of the fake punching things, you know when you act like you're gonna punch? And Abbott's from the street. He was doing that thing. He knocks that guy straight down. He's a big dude. And he knocked him. Guy went down. They all rained on him. It went on for like a stop. A whole stop. Beating on him, everything. Cracked his head with a pipe. He had a hole in his head. Bam, bam, they beat him up. Next stop, they all ran out. He survived. He was okay. He wanted to go home. No, he was bleeding, gushing. And we were like, yo, you got, you got your head cracked. And he was like, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. Dude was still standing. And we took him to uh, Harlem Hospital. With me and Dad, we took him to Harlem Hospital, left him there, and he became okay, and you know, he survived. And mm-hmm. that was terrible. Wow. Lucky we were on the three line. You know, so, I mean, what? yeah, yeah, that's Harlem Hospital, right? Mm-hmm. No, three or one line? Three line, yeah. Yeah, just came in the three. three. Yeah. yeah, two and the three, yeah. Cool. Talk to us about the clubs where you had your biggest battles, and against what crews? Mm. Well, when you remember, I'm an old school big boy. Yeah, I was cast big boy later on, but oh, the mainly was all like, like uh, parks, parks, senses, park senses. You had the small club. You had Harlem World later on. You had Disco Fever, the original one. You had the the Herculoid later on when you can sneak in and get in there. You had the P A L. Yeah. We used to battle in. Third. And then we had your spot. Lambert. Oh, your spot was a course from Webster Projects. <coughs> on, uh, uh, it was the old Burger King. They converted it into a little club. Oh. It's called Your Spot. Oh, oh. Yeah, that was in the early days, 79. They had a Burger King there. They closed down because I think they said it was selling like cat meat or bat meat. So someone took it over and made a club out of it. It was, it was good for a little while, B. I had the opportunity to DJ twice there. They looked out for me. Uh, East, uh, Buddy got me that job. Buddy looked out for me, you know, and um, they had the, uh, the ballroom on um, Boston Post, uh, 
The boy said, no, Tony Tony needs to take me there. Um, what's, the, what's the ballroom's name? Uh, over there yeah. by Baychester, man. Uh, 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 Post Road. Um, not the Eastwood, man. Not the... No, no, no. That was a popular spot, too, but no, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get it. All right. I'm, I'm lucky I even remember half this stuff. <laughs> There's so much stuff going through my head right now. You know, we had so many, you know, Oh, and the other main thing back in the days people don't talk about, where a lot of rock jams were going, b-boy parties were going down, DJing was going on, hidden parties, was house party, hookup parties, and social clubs. No one talks about the social clubs. All right. Or black social clubs, or Puerto Rican social clubs, where you go, dancing, chill, pay a dollar, getting in there. If you knew people, you're free to get in. They sell illegal liquor. They had dancing all night. People come with their instrument, play all night, everybody give love for the community. Yo, social clubs are a big thing. Because where it came from the older generation, from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, started coming to the 60s and creeping into our generation. And letting us go in there with our DJ equipment, renting out, or letting us do a party there. They had Starlight, which was a, a strip club where I used to DJ at. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was right on uh, by the bus yard, you know, in the corner there. Yeah. And my cousin hooked me up with a job there. And I was on the age, but the dude just needed a DJ. And I'm like, yo, I can DJ. He said, all right, just stay. Don't move around, all right? You stay right there in the corner and DJ. I'm like, yo, he said, put a big hat on. I had the big, big, <laughs> one of them, like, gangster hats. I'm like, yo, I look like a fool. I thought, but, you know. They just didn't want me to see my people see my face, but you had the little, little like glass there. You know, DJ booth, the disco right. booths mm -hmm. and and it was a strip club. So <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, 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 it was good, you know. So you had the DJ, and, you know, you get your start. You start learning. You start moving around, doing social club, little block parties, little center parties. You know, block parties. See that, that because that's my time. Like. In the 80s, I had, I had quit b born like 1980, because it was dying out. I did it for a long time already, 75 to 80. How much on? I'm getting older. I need to work. I need to make money. I got to figure out how we're going to get this constant income, yo. Mm -hmm. You know? How am I going to help my mom? Like, all right, we had the fun. We battled. We did the graffiti. Now, how are we going to make money? Uh, we can't keep doing all oh, the younger guys. Oh, yo, yo, I'm learning. I'm good now, man. How about me? Oh, you got to stay with me. Like, yo, dude, be your little kid. You, you do what you got to do. I gotta make money now. I gotta think about what's gonna make me money. Mm -hmm. I gotta think now. I gotta think about helping my mom. After a while, it's, it's already time. So that's what happened. And um, like I said, all them battles, they had little money. Oh, I even forgot one of the main spots too. The Boys Club on 174th. They had some rock dance contests I used to join there. Mm -hmm. And we make a little money. If you didn't get the money, you got, uh, uh, what do you call them, paper gift certificates to go to Woolworths or Corvettes and it's like a rain check paper they give you. They give you a little money like $25, $50. Give me all the big money back to me. You be like, I can buy what I want in Corvettes. <laughs> you go to Woolworths, yo? Alexander's with a, like a coupon thing? You're like, holy. Yo, it was excitement, B. $50. Yeah. Yo, people don't even know. About how they're lucky. Now they look at fifty dollars like nothing. I know time changed, but B. But I want to talk about my fifty dollars. Let me talk about my fifty dollars. That was a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was a lot of money, man. You know, after after we come out the clubs, the parties, the park, the park champs, where mostly people go, it depends on the time. The Chinese restaurant, you can get twenty one shrimps and a little thing. Man, cheap. I don't even remember how much. It had to be like two or three dollars. Yo, you get twenty one shrimps in there. That was a lot of shrimp, B. And you could eat it at the club. If not that, you got White Castle. Everybody in their mother. From all the famous hip hoppers you can name right now, we're sitting on the sidewalk street or in there or outside in there in the street. Hang out. Flash, Kick Rio, Melly Mel, this. You see everybody in the same spot. Because that was the spot that was open. And you see everybody there. No one's acting bigger than the next one. Everybody's hand to hand, eating, chilling with the chicks. Eating White Castle ghetto food, eating, uh, it, it, it was hard to find pizza. It was mostly Italians had that back in the day, so they closed a certain time. But we had the Chinese, and we had that. And then we had the next spot that grew famous. Name it. Murder Burger. Murder Burger. <laughs> the, the biggest. We don't know what it was in there, but it was the biggest. That thing was like, and you $2. had it. Yep, and you sit down, 
You sit down on the sidewalk, or you chilling with your boys, and what everybody just eating. No one's no fancy seating, no one, you know, everybody just, and then the fun was so packed, so your boys are like, come, yo, yo, what's up? You coming here too? Everybody just leave the gym, you see everybody. It was a, the community was dope. The community was dope until people got big headed and tried to separate everything. And to, to this day, I'm getting interviewed with you guys. I respect both of you. And for Bush to be here, you got the right guy. Because someone that was there and made his name, you know, and helped build our other guy's name, which was Case 2, you know. So they both formulated their love for the real culture, you know. So people, you, people sir. just got to stop overlooking and stop also thinking about me, me, me. Right. It can never be me where I've done. So my love and my talk is not about me. First is about who put me here to be here to talk. And that's them guys. May they rest in peace. Cisco Kid, El Dorado Mike, you know, uh, Phase 2, uh, you got my man, man, 3167, Disco Key Mario, so many good people, man. That mm. did a lot. How about Bio? Bio was a great brother. He was from Zulu Nation. He was the bodyguard. His name was Breakout. He knocked you out, dude. It was, it was guys like that that made Zulu King safe and protected for everybody that was there. And when it was B for Zulu, you call them guys. They take care of everything. So you, you, got, you know, you're crew for the community, but you, there's too many people also trying to knock you down. Mm. So you need a group. Shaka Zulus and others to take care. Like, you got a problem? Let's go to the neighborhood. Let's take care of it. First, we talk peace. No peace, we beat. You know? That's how it got to be done. Now, tell us about the hip hop culture courses that you give at area charter schools. Are you allowed to talk about that? Well, I could talk about just what I've been doing my whole life. There you go. Ever since the 80s, been going to census teaching about graph, about the culture of writing, about the D point. Uh, my culture, when I talk, is first about the Bronx, and then about how I spread it in New York. And my spread went from New York, boroughs, to all around America. And when I got tired of America, I went overseas. And that's how I just talk about it. I always talk about, you know, the foundation, how we grew up, how we didn't have much. But we made nothing to something. And the point about that, you could do in your own neighborhood. You know, you got some kids, that sometimes kids don't have no outlook, so you need to give them a picture of this could be what you could be doing. Yeah, and it's a good thing. So doing it in the schools now and doing it overseas or when I travel, and you know, and the people that send me out there and pay me, I'm not, right, they pay me. But it's not when I go there and my job is to do this. I'm not that kind of person. My job is when I get there, I do all I can. Not like, oh, I'm a judge for a weekend. And I got just judge. Oh, Pom Pom, can you speak to the... Nah, 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 nah. Give me money for this. I'm doing only that. No, my job is like, everybody here that needs to know something, learn something, we can do it. I'm here now. Let's do it. Not, my job is not just, I get paid to go here. Right. My job is to go here and to here. And him, her, him, her, old or young to learn something. I got a lot of old people, parents that come... Oh, oh, I love your story. Um, so how was it? Oh, I got no time, man. I, I, I gotta go. I'm hungry. No, I, I got time for everybody. Because you know what? If if that if I had that attitude, I didn't learn the right way. Then phase two, Elder Armite wouldn't have given me the time of day because they were five years older than me. These guys are older than me. They could have been like, ah, no, nah, this young cat, you know? B, it's not like that, man. If you think about how they took you under the wing, Billy? Right. Billy's a master. B, and 76 is already dope. You don't have to be like, oh, I got to teach this kid. I got to hang out with this kid. B, they can take their time. You take your time for the next person, too. Don't ever take nothing for granted. The next time, you be on your ass. Right now, I have to have a dollar in my pocket. But I could call one of my friends, and they'd be like, bomb, I got you. I got you. You want to come live here? You can live here. There's too much people. I'm not looking forward for that. But what I'm saying, you do it from your heart first. And when the time comes, you know who the good people are there for you. Yeah. Right? And that's the sad part, man. People don't want to get back. With all the travel I got, all the friends I met in Japan from the early 80s, from Europe from the 80s, 
to this day, are my friends and people. And they always will try to call me and bring me back to work and do things. I got a place to live anyway, but I don't have to be here. Mm -hmm. I could be somewhere else. But hey, it's just a beautiful culture, man. You know, and look, and look where we at with with all the good people. You know, which too, make people come up to him for a second. He signs. How many people are like I don't sign? The hell? When when do you become like oh, this high profile? Phase two will still right. sign your stuff too, man. Like. What is the problem with the world, B? Right. What's it, what does it mean? All right, do a show and say you're going to sign the book and you want fifty dollars. Okay, let them know ahead of time. But don't be like, if someone comes to you in some other event and be like, yo, can you take my book? And you're like, nah, nah, I don't do it, kid. Or you say, oh, I'll do it for $20. Dude, what happened when you were a kid and you got signatures for free in the bench, yo? Like, there's a time and place for everything. But I don't feel like I got to be like looking at someone like, this guy, this guy is whack. He gave me a book. They looked at a book. This guy's whack. Let me just do a scribble sound. No, sometimes I take my time and do something nice. Because, yeah. you know what? It just feels good to be nice. After what I've been through growing up, it's good to be nice, man. It's good to put down that, that face, that mean face. It's called a deadpan look. They taught me that. You got that look, that look becomes you after a while. Mm -hmm. You straight up like the devil. Like, you're the meanest. You don't give a fuck about nothing. You know, but, but I still had a heart, but still, you have to have this attitude. You better have this look, or else, if you know New York City train back in the days, you couldn't be in a train, man, and looking at someone, and have them look at back you, and it was like a staring contest, right? Mean mug. What? In a in train, you'd be like, one dude look at you, and you know, once you catch someone, and that guy look at you, you're like, wait, wait, what? This motherfucker look at me for what? Mm -hmm. Now the look is going on for a couple of stops. Until someone got the boys to be like, yo, what's up with that, B? You got a problem with me? And then they're going to be. That's what's a scary thing. The train, my new train was a time bomb. To get, to get lit any time. That train, and also walking through a new neighborhood you've never been to. Don't walk there like you're the man. Even if you got a 25. There's probably a group of guys in that corner that they all got a 25. That's right. Straighten up that bomb. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. you go to that neighborhood, you know... People got their walk, you can't help it. Everybody says bomb. I can tell that's bomb from over here, you know, by my walk. But, you know, you come in there, you don't look at no one in the face like, like you know. You know, nah. I've been to almost all the projects in New York. I had girls going to see girls, seeing friends from Brooklyn to Queens Park to, yo. No matter how, how you go, you know you got a heart. You just go there in peace. You go to the door, that dude's right there standing by the door, you're like, yeah, what's up, man? Oh, peace. You know, that's it. You don't have to say nothing, or you can say something. Or something. Oh, what's up, man? That's it. No, leave it alone. No, you know. Get the bell, get in there. Because I got robbed before. Mm -hmm. I got robbed before in the pink houses. A girl set me up. A black girl I was going out with. You know? That was the day I thought I was going to get again. <laughs> and they got me in the hallway. Wow. I, hey, I came back with my boy, and he took care of business. That's why... There's things like, you know, community that takes care of each other and look out for each other. You might be alone that day, but as long as you leave that place alive, you can always come back and straighten things out. But I got my stuff back. And it was evil. Girls was a big setup back in the days. That's right. Yeah. At any party, from PAL to any jam, you meet a girl, they taking you back. They got that phone call already set. Mm -hmm. There's dudes waiting. Waiting. Oh, yeah. You see him disappear from the place, go to that payphone in the corner. I got him. Yeah, he got two two links on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he got braces. Yeah. He got this hat. He got this color. Yeah, he's this color, this guy. Yeah. And when she's rolling back in the hood with them, they waiting. And if you walk that corner or go in the building, they right there in the lobby or somewhere. And then they'll get you. Some are ruthless. Some, wow. some will just stab you and take your stuff. Some will just beat you up. Someone won't even let you go. After you give them your shit, someone wants to be a tough man. But on the brass nut, crack my boy in his eye. You know? He wants to go, he wants to be something in his life. I think he wants to go to the military or something. I forgot what he wanted to do in life. But play. It was years ago. And from that incident, someone cracked him in his jaw. In his jaw, broke his whole socket here. The bones around his eye, vision lost. Couldn't do nothing after that. Certain things he wanted to do, he couldn't. 
And I bridge him all messed up. Wow. You take a life when he gave you all his shit. I had a friend taking a train coming from a club in uh, 81. My boy's little brother. He's on the train, fell asleep. They didn't even wake him up. They just put the gun in his mouth and they shot him. He survived. The bullet got landed under his jaw. They took a sheepskin and everything, go, everything. Left that nigga to dead. Left him dead on left him to die in the train. Someone saw him from the ambush. He survived. That bullet they could never take out. But he passed away. He moved to Poland and he passed away. We like to end the interviews with this one question. What does the Bronx mean to you? My family. My family, my community, the place that made me who I am to this day. And that's a good person. Because I could have been a bad person the other way. They made me a good person and gave me knowledge and all the education and things I learned from the Bronx have been spreading around the world. And they all came from my mission from PR to the Bronx. You know, the love of Puerto Rican culture always will be in me and my nationality. So my nationality of African, Puerto Rican is for everyone, every you. Either you're Italian, Irish, you know, no matter where you're from, we're all the same race. That's the human race. Not the black race, not the Puerto Rican race, not the white race. It's the human race. The human has no color. It has no one person. We are all human to rock on. I'm going to rock on till I drop. All right. Sweet. And we also like to ask all the artists that we interview if you can uh, write your tag down in our book for us. Only if I get a tag from both of you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. I'll, I'll try. Butch got it. Yeah, yeah. I'll get a tag from both of you. I got it. So, setting up your tag. Early days with the tagging, people dress up their tag to the teeth. Because the tag, the hit was the main thing to do. That thing went from a skinny tag. And, you know, skinny tag has, you know, it had no style, but it was all one color. They start adding color, especially in a black book. They took, started taking the tag to the next level. Overlapping, putting 3D, putting shadow, putting outline, doing light color orange with a black outline. It was all your tag. Putting stars, halos, crowns, arrows. And one thing people don't understand, Philly's old school, they got their arrows. But New York, our arrows go towards our name. Philly arrows go out their names. So when they do a wicked tag, their arrows go out. In New York, we go in. This is me. I'm here to rock. And that's what we do in New York. We point the arrow to our name. You know? How you like that? I don't know. How you like me now? <laughs> so no matter what you learn from graffiti culture, you want to do it the best you can. Start innovating. When I came back into writing, people were like, that's not how you use a tech. But it's not that. It's about what my mentor said. Every mentor I had, Billy, to face, don't stay stuck. And I'm like, what that mean? Don't stay stuck, man. If you're going to be in this game, and you're going to be in a long run, you take your style as far as you can. You take your evolution of your letters as far as you can. You don't just stay here. I like everybody likes this, but no, it's not about what everybody likes, about mm -hmm. how much you can change and keep rocking. Footwork style, everything. You got to keep DJ style, you got to keep it moving, man. A lot of people don't want to do that, man. You come back, people see you. Oh, you're a young cat, you wouldn't want B, it's not about that, B. If you don't want to hear it, you don't have to hear it. It's not about looking like I have to have a white beard to say I came from this time. It's about how good you take care of yourself to know that you want to keep living, you know? And by not jerking people, that's how God takes care of you. Not jerking people. <clears throat> you know, not taking advantage of people. You know? The health, the look, everything comes from you. You just be good. You give up. You give to the next. <coughs> You're not asking for, for something in return.
many people looking to get somewhere where yeah. they've never been. Yeah. Selfish, greedy people. I don't know with them people. Yeah. The old saying, the old saying is, when you jerk so, when you jerk me once, it'll never be a second time. There you go. That's how you. That's how you learn from your mentor. First time someone jerks you, he ain't worth to be your friend. So all the people that ratted me, snitch on me when I went to a train yard, or racking up, or going here, or doing something, then they not around no more, and they wish they was. You know? True that. You know? And I played some of the main crews around. You know, remember ACC? ACC, All City Crew, Car 21. Yeah. He passed away. I was a really good friend of mine from the area. Oh, some Chiba action, man. Yeah, Chiba action too, man. But that's why, when people say, Mom, how you getting all these crews from Brooklyn? And then they like, don't believe me. But then when I go to some event, the Queens guy's like, yo, that's my man, Mom. Yo, he's a roll with us. He needs to know Vade, man. He was down with TPA. Oh, he was, because, yeah, you know, it's not worth talking to someone that don't want to hear it. I don't know, I got no, I got no time to waste my energy on anyone. I don't have to, I don't have to explain why, how I look like this. I don't have to explain anything to anyone. I just got to say what I want to say. If you want to believe it, you believe it. If you don't want to believe it, you don't have to believe it. I'm fine with that. So only you and your real people know where you came from. You know? And that's West Farm. The Boogie Down Bronx, man. But back in there, he had a, he had a crew called Chiba Action. Chiba Chiba yeah, was a big thing. The weed that's smoking right. days. <laughs> <clears throat> haven't heard it called that in a long time. Yeah, that's the original word, man. Chiba. Yeah. He's, he's smoking. Yeah, Chiba Chiba, man. And sometimes when you put different color around, it, it decorates your little thing here. Yeah. You know? You start decorating all your stuff. It's over? Oh, I'm still recording. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, what? I thought you're you, done. I'm gonna have you hold that up when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Hold okay. that up for the camera. Oh, man. Let me just, uh. Let me just, uh. I'm putting color around like design, so. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you put the colors in the center of you. Oh, and TCT. Oh, my boy. You remember TCT? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's too much to name, but I got it in there. I'm hot. Sweet. You want to show us the, uh, oh, yeah. the work? Yeah, for the, for the camera. Nice. Bomb. Double O. Bomb five. five. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to show you the first of all tab. All right, go ahead. Let me show you the old tag. I'm going to keep this on. Yeah, and I'll show you the tag that's... Seventy-six. Yeah. So I had to change the B like that, but... I had to get out of the memory of the new tag. Well, this new tag is old, man. It's the end of the sentence. B's like this. But, but the B's were like this. Oh. Gotcha. Read that like five. Oh, five corners. <laughs> At least he's doing the middle of the page the right way. <laughs> no, we got to have lost that one. And then we got... Death Riders. Yep. That was the beginning. And that was it. That was what, that's how it started? What year was that? Well, when I first writing? Yeah. No, no, when I first started writing, I tell you, it was 
1975, when I left the gang. But I got this name in, in the beginning of 76. Right. That's why I kept the 76. Right. And then I changed it to 5. You know? Uh, it's kind of nice to get the five. Five men are lots of me. You know? Five men are lots of me. Personal now, that's your, that's your signature. It's definitely you. Yeah. Well, the, uh, El Marco, man, that's the man, B. That's the man. That's the, oh, let me play it to you. That's the man. Yeah. There it is, Bomb 76, Five Deadly Writers. Yeah. Awesome nice. oral history. Thank you so much, Bomb 5. Yeah, thank you guys. Much appreciated. Yes, One love to the Bronx. Peace. Thank you. Bye.